Welcome everyone. Welcome to the International Webinar Series 1, year 2022. We shall start within uh, one minute. So, okay, I think we are starting now uh, while we are waiting for our um, audience to join in. Yeah. So, first thing I would like to say uh, good afternoon and good day to everybody in this webinar. So, we are honored to have you all here as a team speakers and audience. So, in this webinar series, it's a very special uh, in a way that we have five architecture schools from four different countries to collaborate and disseminate the knowledge to the audience presenters. With that, let me bid the sincere welcome to SRM Institute Science, Technology and Velo Institute of Technology, India, Universitas Indonesia and Walaila University, Thailand. And not to forget to all the audience present here to the webinar series today, not only from India, Indonesia, Thailand, and Malaysia, I guess, but potentially all over the world. We, University Technology Malaysia, UTM, as the host of the International Webinar Series 1, year 2022, welcome you with the open heart and thank you for joining our webinar today. So let me introduce myself. My name is Leng Pao Chung, also known as PC. I think most of you are the family with me from UTM and I will be responsible for hosting the session today. And I'm glad to welcome our honorable speakers of today. Okay, let me introduce the speakers. So for our first speaker of today, Prof. Dr. Pradipa, the head of Architecture School SRMIST, will be talking about the oral um, comfort in the built environment. Our second speaker of today, Nevin Rafa Kasuma, the Associate Re Lecturers from Departments of Architecture, Universitas Indonesia, will be deliver her topic on fear of crimes in underground transit public area. Prof. Mohafiz Riaz, the Assistant Professors of Schools of Architecture and Planning, Velo Institutes of Technology, India, as the third speaker of the day, We'll be talking about architecture from generations, conventions versus computational. Associate Professor Dr. Cairo Anwar Kaizil, the research group head diplom and the research fellow of University Technology Malaysia, will deliver his topic on shaping sustainability, a design imperative speakers. And as for our fifth speakers from Walaila University, Thailand, Associate Professor Dr. Kit Chai Jitka Jonwanis, who is the International Affairs Licensed Walaila University Architecture Schools, Walaila University, Thailand, will deliver his topic on authentic participation versus pseudo participation. So please take note for each speaker time. The time allocated for each of the talk is around 30 minutes. And we are going to start with our speaker number one followed by number two and number three. Chronologically and subsequently, we are going to have 15 minutes for Q&A after the three speakers as the first session. So after the Q&A sessions, we're going to have our first um, photo sessions, okay, after the Q&A session. So session two, going to start immediately after the speaker number four and followed by speaker number five. The webinar will be ended with uh, 30 minutes Q&A sessions and another round of the photo sessions. So audience are free to ask questions during these periods. And should you have any questions during the talk, please drop your questions in the chat section at the bottom right corners of the Webex window for me to collect and bring it forward during the Q&A sessions afterward. So for the viewers for this webinar, I will attach the links of attendance form in the chat box later. So please kindly fill in your details we will send you the e-certificates after the webinars. All right, without further ado, I shall invite our UTM Architecture School's Director, Associate Professor Dr. Ellie Sabrina, to deliver the welcoming speech for today, International Webinar Number 1, Year 2022. The floor is yours, Dr. Alice. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. PC, as the moderator for today. So good afternoon and a very warm welcome to all the audience attending this first International Webinar Series 2022 organized by the UTM Architecture Program. To all my colleagues and students from Velo Institute of Technology, from SRM 
Institute of Science and Technology, Walaila University from Thailand, and Universitas Indonesia, as well as UTM. Thank you so much and glad to meet all of you. So I would like to say my warmest thank also to all the speakers for today, Prof. Dr. C. Pradipa, who is the Head of School of Architecture from SRM IST India, from Prof. Mohavis Riaz from Velour Institute of Technology, Madam Nevin Rafa Kasuma from Universitas Indonesia, Associate Professor Dr. Kit Chai from Wailaila University, and also Dr. Kairol from our own UTM. So thanks again for accepting all our invitation today as the guest speakers. So as we can see that today's webinar talk is actually the first series held by UTM Architecture School for the year 2022. So as the director of the UTM Architecture School, I feel very honored today because we have five outstanding, prominent and successful speakers from four countries. We have Thailand, India, Indonesia, and also Malaysia, who can actually share their interests and niche area, focusing on a variety of architectural issues and also knowledge. So today's webinar will actually be an eye opener to all because in the developed and well developed countries, architecture and the built environment are a big challenge faced by all, namely during the post pandemic COVID situation. So therefore, I hope that today's intellectual discourse will act as a starting point to spark the discourse on architecture and the built environment in the 21st century. And we can relook really back what are the best options, the best approaches to improve the quality of life in four countries, Thailand, India, Indonesia, and also Malaysia, and also on how we live and the way we should be educated and how we should act for the future. So as Winston Churchill always mentioned, we shape our buildings, thereafter they shape us. So the mother of art is architecture. Without architecture of our own, we have no soul of our own civilization. So every great architect is necessarily a great poet. He or she must be a great original interpreter of his time his day and his age. So today's discourse also is a collaborative effort between four institutions and may this discourse strengthen the ties within these four countries representing India, Thailand, Indonesia and also Malaysia for further research and academic collaboration between Walaila University, Thailand, Universitas Indonesia, Indonesia, ISRM Institute of Technology, India, Velour Institute of Technology, India with University Technology, Malaysia. So with this, I wish everyone the very best and here is to looking forward to our collaborations for the future and also for the coming time. So I hope we can learn the best from all the five speakers today. So with that, I wish everyone good luck and may you enjoy the session and today's event. Thank you so much. Thank you all. So I pass it back to Dr. PC as the moderator for today. Thank you very much, Associate Professor Dr. Ellis, for the welcoming speech of the webinars. Okay, so after the officiation uh, sessions by Dr. Ellis, all right, without further ado, I shall introduce our first speaker of the sessions, Professor Dr. C. Pradipa, the head of Architecture School SRMIST. So let me uh, briefly introduce Prof. Pradipa. Prof. Pradipa is majoring in the climate responsive architecture, architectural acoustic and lighting services in tall buildings as well as GIS. She has published in multiple international and national journals and also the recipients of national and international awards since her student years. Her research interests are on the studies on the acoustic de design and performance of the multi-purpose halls in the Indian context. So let us welcome Prof. Pradipa with the topic of webinar entitled Oral, uh, Oral Comfort of in the Built Environment. With this, environment. I will give this room yes, to Pradipa to take over. Pradipa Prof, the room over. is yours. Prof, the room is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ling. Uh, thank you, UTM Malaysia, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, let me finish my presentation. Is my screen is visible link? Ah uh, yes, prof. Yeah, it's on the first page. Uh, yes, like yes. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, you may start any time you are okay. ready. Uh, the topic today is, yes, thank you. Uh, the today uh, topic which I'm going to present is about the importance of the environment. Uh, my field is tied in uh, about the size and the acoustical performance of the multi-purpose hall in the contract. So let me uh, uh, introduce about the various standards that have to be followed for the multi-purpose hall design or auditorium design. And with an example and a methodology to be followed, how well the parameters could be involved in the multiple sort. Uh, coming to the contents, uh, the presentation which is going to cover is about the basic principles. Now, since the students also involved in this uh, lecture series, I want to explain about what are the basic principles to be followed uh, for any design of the auditorium or multipurpose hall. Next comes the acoustical defects and the acoustical performance and analysis of the multipurpose hall. And uh, below a uh, picture which was uh, given in the presentation, is uh, our uh, SRM IAC, uh, the biggest, Asia is one of the biggest auditorium, uh, which is of 3000 plus seating capacity. And this is uh, the first picture, the external view, and the second is the interior part of this auditorium. Coming to the basic principles, uh, the we have to do before going for any auditorium design or multi purpose design, one uh, basic criteria we have to do is site selection. So the first uh, problem normally arises is the background noise. So in order to avoid the background noise, uh, the noise survey has to be considered. So you, you have to give the quietest possible conditions in order to have the intelligibility of the speech does not suffer. When the term comes to intelligibility, it is a new term. It is nothing but the clarity of the speech. Also, we have to consider about the air conditioning noise should be avoided. So air conditioning is provided should be with the special care. And uh, so the taken has to be taken like uh, the plant noise and the grill noise should be avoided. So you have to check whether the background noise should not be more than 40 to 45 dB. In case if that is the background noise which is more than 45 to 40, 40 to 45 dB which was coming inside the hall, the proper um, installation that is the acoustical material care has to be taken in order to avoid the background noise. Next completion size and going for the design. If uh, a student has given a thesis as a campus design or selected any campus design and the project. Uh, the size and, size and the shape of the auditorium which plays a major role. Uh, the three groups, it, has, it, can, it can be categorized into three groups. One is the rectangular plan, horseshoe shaped plan, and then plan. The size should be fixed based on the number of audience. So initially, the score for the design as a number of uh, seating capacity. He has to check what is the number of seating capacity he is going to be work for the auditorium or a multi-purpose hall. Uh, then the shape, uh, the, then the shape could be decided. So, so normally after calculation, the number uh, the, that is for per person, it should be 0 0.6 to 0 0.9 square meter per person. And uh, he has to consider, like, like the student has to consider the height of the hall, uh, that is a ventilation, but the, uh, the auditorium is designed with the presence or the absence of a balcony. And what is the type of performance? The type of performance actually has a major role. When going for the type of performance, the performance could be of only for the music, or it could be of a multi-purpose performance could be happen inside the hall, or sometimes it is only for the conference. So you have to decide what are the types of performance you are going for the design of the auditorium design. Next, the seating capacity. The arrangement seating up first is the seating capacity for the for the design the size of the shape of the hall. Next, how well you are going to arrange the seats. Therefore, the, the normal, you all know that is while studying the acoustics uh, subject, that is a line, uh, that is a maximum line of sight should not exceed 30 degree. And uh, they generally, the front row of the audience through the stage, the distance you have to follow 3 to 6 meter for in case of drama and 4.5 uh, meter for cinema purpose. So all these are the standards you have to follow it while designing the auditorium or any multi-purpose hall design. So you have to the, the next one is the seating height. The seating height, height should not be more than 75 centimeter or more. The width of the sheet the seat should be 45 centimeter and 56 centimeter. So it all depends. Everything uh, is the standards which has to be uh, followed with the design and the seating arrangement inside the auditorium. Uh, next slide was whenever you take any auditorium, the main important thing may be considered for any designing of the uh, installation of the materials will be one will be the flooring, second will be the side wall, next one will be the uh, rear wall, and next one will be the stage. So all these which is a major element for a good auditorium, speech clarity inside the hall. So next comes the side walls. The side walls are non-parallel as in the case of the fan shade of the hall. So the walls may remain reflective and they should be architecturally fixed. 
for example if already constructed hall but the side walls are parallel you have to have a proper treatment so that is the, the, the for example from uh, that is from uh, the stage to the uh, 1.5 meter the side walls you have to left untreated because there should not be any element should be designed there are few acoustical defect defects will also happen inside the hall like the flutter echo because when you have a plan of uh, parallel walls uh, for the body on the design that is the chances of acoustical defect which is known as a uh, flutter echo that all of this should be avoided if you are going for the parallel walls if you are going for the parallel walls the proper acoustical treatment by the installation of the materials should be uh, followed so uh, for the greater seat seating capacity if you want to increase the seat capacity the side walls should be placed from the stage that playing of the side walls you can go till maximum of the seat degree not goes beyond that because if you go beyond that the vision will be uh, uh, will distract the vision of the Uh, whatever which is going which was performance is happening inside the I mean in the stage you can't be able to see properly therefore generally for the fan shape hall uh, that is the performance is a music for the fan shape is the hall those one prefer next comes the stage it will be larger for the theaters and smaller for the cinema, uh, cinema halls which depends upon the size of the screen the, the rear wall you have to have a flat or convex shape and it should not be concave in shape in case if you can't able to avoid the concave shape of the auditor i mean rear wall you have to have a special treatment for that so in you have to avoid this place or corrugate and that is convex corrugate inside the uh, a hall in order to have a sound focus to avoid the sound focus in the hall next comes on the roof and ceiling uh, normally the false ceiling will be provided in the auditorium design with a view uh, usually with the flat trusses that is trusses the portion of the false ceiling which is under process is constructed of reflective material and is suitably inclined to help the reflection from the stage to the seats of the hall the remaining portion of the ceiling can be acoustically treated so suppose in case uh, if you have a concave shaped ceiling it has to be avoided because you can't give a concave shaped ceiling because the sound will go and sit inside the concave uh, shaped ceiling area so the rear part of the ceiling may be treated with the sound absorbing material in order to have a proper control of reverberation reverberation is one of the main parameter in the hall and partly to prevent the built up of audience noise noise also so, so when there is a built up of audience noise automatically there is a possibility of echo so you have to avoid this the average height you can go for the small hall is 6 meters and 7.5 meters for the large hall the ceiling may be flat in case if you want to have a slight increase in the height near the center of the hall the volume per person should be range between 3.5 to 5.5 cubic meter for a public lecture hall and uh, for cinema the theater is 4 to 5 cubic meter for musicals or concert halls it can be 2 to 5.5 cubic meter next important criteria is the flooring normally the flooring will be the seating arrangement will be arranged in the successive rows of to have a rise over the preceding ones therefore the rise the luminous head is above 12 cm above the path of the sound so that the sound can pass over the head of the frame in front of the audience next comes the balcony projection which is a major role it depends upon the individual uh, architects or the designer whether to have the balcony space or absence of balcony space so suppose if there is a balcony provided its projection into the hall should not be more than twice the pre height of the opening of the balcony access next comes the line of sight Line of sight is should not is not inclined more than 30 degrees to the horizontal. Uh, next comes the foyers and the attached rooms. The foyer and the number and the size of the entrances also depend on the size and the seating capacity of the auditorium. So 20% of the seating capacity is recommended for the foyer space, and 10% of the seating area is recommended for the lobby and the lounge space. Uh, there are a lot of acoustic. There are these are the acoustical defects which I am probably you can expect in the intro space. One is the reverberation. Next is the formation of echoes, sound focus, dead spot, insufficient loudness, and exterior noises. So reverberation is nothing but the persistence of the sound in the enclosed space after the source of sound is stopped. Uh, which this is one of the main parameter for any of the design of the auditorium or multi-purpose hall. Reverberant sound is the reflected sound as a result of improper absorption. When the absorption is not proper, automatically there is a possibility of the reverberant uh, sound. inside the hall reverberation may also re result in the confusion with the sound created next therefore the reverberation the essential is for to improve the quality of the sound the time which was uh, during which the sound persists is called the reverberation time you can see the tabular column which was given below 
this is the evaporation this is for the normal hall so the evaporation it is has to be uh, meant in seconds uh, if it is 0.5 to 1.5 it is very excellent when the evaporation time is comes in 0.5 to 1.5 if it is 1.5 to 2 it is good and 2 to 3 it is fairly good 3 to 5 it is bad and above 5 seconds is very bad for in case if you are going for a small room uh, if you are going for the study of the classroom acoustic also the evaporation plays a major role for the classroom acoustic it can be of between 0.5 to 1.5 it for the bigger hall for example if it is 3000 plus capacity of the auditorium it is evaporation time is recommended for 1 to 2 which is as actually it is very good for the bigger halls of the size of seating capacity 3000 plus next comes the form air formation of echoes echoes is one of the major uh, defect inside the hall so that has to be avoided an echo is produced when the reflected sound only reaches the ear just when the original sound from the same source has been already heard so this is nothing but the repetition of the echo a repetition of the sound and this is one of the other acoustical defects next is the sound foci and dead spots as i said the reason why you have to avoid the concave uh, shape the rear wall and the concave shape the ceiling there is a possibility of the sound foci and the dead spots the shape of the hall makes the sound waves to concentrate in some particular areas of the hall that is known as a sound foci and these spots are known as the sound foci this defect can be removed based on the geometrical design shapes of the interior spaces so the dead spots is nothing but the high concentration of reflected sound at this sound foci that is the deficiency of related sound at some other points and these parts are known as the dead spots when well, sound intensity is very low that is insufficient for hearing so this defect can be removed by using the the external noise normally external noise is nothing but the background noise so external noise from the vehicles traffic engines factories machines may enter inside the hall through the openings or even through the walls and other structural elements having improper sound insulation so this defect can be removed by proper planning of the hall and also from the proper site selection this as we this can be avoided inside the uh, that is a placement of the auditorium in the campus design so these are the standards till now whatever i have explained is the standard to be followed for the design of the uh, auditorium and after following these standards you have to check whether all these uh, the parameters uh, is better or goes with the clarity and the whether the clarity of the sound is there inside the hall an example was taken here for uh, explain how to find out the experimental third uh, whether the auditor whether the evaluation time and other parameters is good inside the particular hall a multi purpose hall has been chosen here and uh, and the architectural features will be explained uh, and methodology about the software and acoustical parameters what are the acoustical parameters which was carried out inside the hall in order to find the quality inside the hall is good or bad okay for any multi purpose hall an audio auditorium a good acoustic which is was that there should be a good distribution of this it depends upon the whether you are going for the proper shaping or for the seating capacity or the finish everything whatever matters you have to have a good distribution so it is not when you when the good distribution of the sound it matters like you have the intro till Again. So the sound the next is a player that will go crazy. That is going to be from this. Uh, this is uh, the ticket elevator. Evaporation is carried out. This sound level meter is nothing but uh, it was given in the standard of ISO three three seven four three two, and it is uh, this sound level meter which was given when the picture is not sonic one three two. This is the number which was given for uh, for this meter. The instrument is set up. How the instrument is set up for uh, calculating the evaporation time inside the hall is. Uh, based on the impulse excitation you have to create a impulse uh, uh, sound that is uh, whether it can be of a pistol sort or it can be of the paper bag 
by exploding of the paper bag or exploding of the balloon because you have to create a sound energy then the excitation could be calculated in the ivy hall as this starts once this excitation sound is created uh, the, the after uh, switching on the sound level meter it starts reading what is the reverberation time uh, whether you whatever the position you are standing or whether you are standing in the front row or middle row or the last row it starts calculating the reverberation time so based on the reverberation time you can check whether this part the particular hall whatever you are going for the calculation is uh, giving a good reverberation time which is an expected or not so the, here the, this is a, a sound level meter which is used for this experiment and the next in, in, uh, experiment which was uh, done as a audience simulation software this audience simulation software is nothing but the uh, this is this is mainly used to calculating the auditorium acoustical uh, software uh, the considering the room geometry and the surface properties you have to uh, do everything in the google sketchup then it has to be exported to the audience software it starts reading it it starts uh, reading it once it starts reading it it starts giving after you, you have to uh, set the source and receiver positions inside the hall then after setting the source and receiver positions you have to install the materials as a simulation part once everything was done after that it starts simulating and give you the reading about the acoustical parameters reading so you can test it. this 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 uh, software also typical parameter that will be reading sound uh, reverberation time so you can have a reference by using the sound level meter uh, reverberation time and audience simulation software reverberation time you can check it whether it the both the reverberation time are equal or not if not again you have to go for the testing so some insulation some defects is there inside the auditorium uh, you can be able to uh, check whether the reverberation time is right or wrong so this method employed uh, is a image source method along with the ray tracing the acoustical observations of material with respect to various octave frequency has been chosen properly and this is a sound mapping the given below picture is the sound mapping and next picture is the sound distributions in say the, that is the first row second row and third row and this is a graphical representation of the early decay, decay time values and this picture uh, this picture which shows how the simulation uh, software starts calculating the energy parameter and sound pressure level everything so once it starts calculating it gives the parameter values of the individual parameters value which is very important for the acoustical uh, design and here an example of an auditorium which was chosen here is the chennai auditorium the auditorium is a fan shaped hall with a seating capacity of 900 it covers an area of 6600 square meter the stage is 900 mm from the floor and the length is 50 meter the side walls are finished with the wooden panels finished in the back and the front of the hall the seats are medium upholstered with a cloth covering even the seats also plays a major role for the acoustical calibration parameters the spacing between the groups of the seats is 1 meter at the lower and 1.5 meter at the upper level of the room the height of the seating rows is 10 cm at the lower and the 20 cm at the upper level these are the acoustical features of the individual that is this hall the floor is covered with a carpet except the stage that has a wooden flooring on a hard floor the rear of the stage is closed by fabric curtains hung 1 meter from the wall the access doors to the auditorium are made up of wood the ceiling is fitted with a sound absorbent and reflective panel that has metallic ring with a slope of 6 inches from the beginning of the stage to the rear wall of the room and the, the, right, the right hand side picture you can see the interior part of the auditorium which is in chennai Uh, and then the given below the tabular column shows the geometrical parameters. What is the length of the hall, width of the hall, what is the depth of the stage, volume, seating capacity. So all this which was given in the tabular column. These are the geometrical details of the. Hall. And uh, the side walls, as I explained in the previous mail, and uh, this is the plan of the hall, which is a fan shape. You can see how the seating arrangement is given inside the hall. And the below picture which shows one part of the design, that is the interior view which goes to the stage. a next one is a section of the hall and these are the item description which was given in the other column in this slide next one is the uh, software overview the software overview as i said uh, here the software which was a lo lot of software available for the uh, acoustical uh, calculation but this gives the accurate value which was uh, uh, this is known as audience simulation software which is extremely for the auditorium design So I tell you how this software works. That is, first you have to do the geometrical modeling by using a Google SketchUp. So once this uh, once this modeling has been done, it has to be exported to the audience simulation software. After it starts, after exporting to the audience simulation software, 
you have to assign the materials as the materials which was original materials as i explained in the previous two slides before that materials you have to assign it so once it is assigned the, the materials you have to give the uh, source and the receiver question the sources will be on the stage the receivers on the the receivers will be the audience those who are sitting inside the hall all this uh, simulation was done by representing the rays therefore that will be a line a straight line connection from the source to the receiver you can see the picture uh, which was the, the, the above picture which shows the uh, the materials which were assigned in for the simulation and the second picture which shows a single point away from the source you can see the similar red line how it passing from the source to the receiver how the sound is passed from the source to the receiver so here you no know, you have the two methods uh, that is uh, Uh, in, in instead of going for the detailed calculation of the simulation, you can also have a quick estimate. Quick estimate which talks about uh, after installing the materials in the list, uh, it starts quickly calculating the giving only the parameters value alone. Suppose if the parameters value is quickly set, what about the parameters that are calculated by using the sound level data? You can go for the detailed study. If not, if the quick estimate doesn't give the uh, right picture, right right calculation of the reverberation time. Whatever you have done with the sound simulation, so you have to find it whether the data is sound disturbed in the simulation or uh, the defects inside the hall. So this uh, this is uh, two methods are there. One is a quick estimate and the global estimate. Global estimate you can even uh, which which starts predicting the single point, multi point, and the response results. That is single point is nothing nothing but the single audience, multiple audience, and even for the grid response results. By using the OEM simulation software. So here, after uh, uh, assigning the materials and after uh, uh, assigning the source and the receiver position and also all the uh, part, and it starts giving the reverberation time. This is uh, the picture which shows the sound mapping. That is, we were using the OEM simulation software. It starts giving the reverberation time, which is the main parameter for the acoustical design. So after you can see the tabular column which was given below. This is the reverberation uh, time values. Uh, the first uh, row which shows the measured value and the second row which shows the simulated value. So measured is nothing but using the sound level meter. Simulated by using the audio simulation software. So you can see the 500 which is a uh, which is a uh, uh, median part. That is uh, 500 uh, hertz. Uh, this is frequency 250, 500, 100. All it's a frequency. When coming changing with the mid frequency alone, you can see the measured is 1.31 and simulated is 1.32, which is have a better agreement within the two. So you can say the auditorium is a very good, better. It has a very good agreement with the reverberation and time. The it, the design is also good. Therefore, the sound clarity will be good in this particular hall. If that is any difference in the that is if the reverberation times goes below of uh, the three or four, you have to have some that is a defect inside the hall. Then you have to go for the installations of the absorption material, as I said in the previous slide. And next is the clarity, which is one of the other parameter. This clarity is. Uh, Uh, nothing but the uh, high ratio of the early sound energy to the late to the reverberant energy. That is, if the sound, the whatever we arrive to the listeners ears, no, it has to reach within 80 milliseconds. That is, some uh, seconds you have to reach the particular sound. So, if the calculation is not proper in the simulation, automatically you can say that there is a defect in the clarity parameter of the hall. And uh, the sound mapping shows the clarity. What is the clarity which is in this particular hall? What have I chosen for an example? And this is the definition. This is also one of the very main uh, parameter. It is defined as a ratio of the early received sound energy to the total received sound energy. If you can say the sound mapping shows the definition, and the graph shows how the definitions have been calculated, which is one of the parameter for the acoustical design. And next was the lateral fraction. The lateral fraction is a subjective sense of spatial impressions or envelopment, and is inversely related to the width of the hall based on the size of the hall, whether length and the width of the hall. This lateral fraction plays a major role, and uh, this gives us all this uh, audience simulation software gives the parameter for the lateral fractions also. Our uh, next one is the sound transmission index. It is used to predict the speech intensity. Intensity, as I said, is something like the clarity. One of the other definitions for the intensity is the clarity. For example, if uh, intensity for uh, this para for this hall is uh, normal, this is the 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 given here is zero to zero point zero is unintelligible. It is a it is a basic term rule you have to follow, but in this hall the speech intensity is 0.79, which is very excellent by using this audio simulation software. Uh, the oration, this oration is one is another parameter. Uh, the reflectogram displays the arrival of how uh, what uh, what is the time period of arriving the sound to the listener's ear, 
the array of curly reflection to the receiver and each angle reflection can be separated independently based on the early reflection. The arrival time and the energy of the reflections can be determined by the reflectogram and this is a reflectogram calculation. You can see the picture which was given here. The first line and the second line, the first line it starts in 0, the second line it is 0 0.02. That is it, is, it is reaching the listeners here between the acceptable range. So in order to avoid the defect of echoes, this correlation plays a major role. If it is not reaching, if it is graph is showing behind that is um, the millisecond, you have to uh, understand that is some defect inside the hall, then you have to go for the proper treatment for the hall. So the next one is a BRR, which is nothing but the binaural impulse response of the receiver at 30 meter away from the sound source. That is, it has to reach the listeners here between 10 to 20 milliseconds. So all these seconds, no, you have to have a calculation for this. So based on this, you can any designer. That is, uh, previously you can you, 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 yeah, if we uh, have a design like uh, for the designing of the hall or uh, any auditorium design, we can use the simulation software for the testing to understanding of it what material to be installed inside the hall in order to uh, avoid all these defects inside the hall. So simulation to correlation indicates the arrival of the direct sound at the listeners here. So finally, what conclusion I got from this hall is the reverberation characteristics in, in, in uh, considering sublime creating everything knows what is sublime formula. And there are other researchers also you have who have done the reverberation testing. One is hearing and natural base. The other the absorption claims have been calculated for the hall. In general, the sublime absorption shooted well with the experimental results, which shows the halls of family diffuse. Next comes the clarity parameter. Shown. It is ranges from 2.5 to 9.5 dB uh, decibel uh, with respect to the frequency. The average values of strength and definitions of 4.5 dB and 70% respectively. The electrical fractions found to be very good in the hall, whatever we just given for an example. The experimental studies have been conducted to determine the reverberation characteristics. Subsequently, the simulated values of ODN have compared the experimental value, which is in closer agreement. The ODN programming has been suitably used by selecting the nearest absorption characteristics of the material employed in the halls. Evaluation of objective parameters such as clarity, strength, lateral diffraction, definitions, sound transmission index, oscillation is used in information apart from the RT. The average number of reflections required to ODN software, it is used here, is around 30. So this is the conclusion which I got after this uh, two methodology. One is uh, the using the sound laminator and second one is by using the Odeon simulation software. There are other testing also which also done for the hall by using the machine learning algorithm, but it will be too heavy. There is a limitation in the time also for this webinar. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. All right. Thank you very much, Professor Deepa, for the interesting elaborations on the topic of the oral comfort in the built environment. I'm sure that students and all of us have been learning a lot from this topic. Okay. Um, for the audience, shall we have any questions? Probably you can put them in the chat box. So later on, after that, we are going to um, ask that we are going to speak at the end of this speech by the end of this speech by. All right. So far, right. of our next speaker so far, uh, our will be from speaker, Universitas Indonesia, from Universitas Nevin Rafa Kusuma, Associate Lecturer from Departments of Architecture. She has the degrees of the Masters of Arts in Interior Designs and Bachelors of Arts in Architecture. Other than teaching, she has involved in the various research community engagement projects, international level publications and design experience since 2017. So for today, we will, we will be talking about fear of crime in underground transit pub, public area. Without further ado, I welcome Madam Nevin Rafa Kusuma to start the talk. The room is yours, Madam. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor for me to have the opportunity to address such a distinguished audience. Let me introduce myself. I'm Nevin Rafa from the University of Indonesia. In my presentation, I would like to present my study in 2019 about fear of crime in underground public transit space at Manggarai Station. So I will begin by filling you in on the background as to why we need to focus on studying the psychological aspects comfort and safety of underground transportation. 
The population of DKI Jakarta by June 2021 was 11.25 million. This indirectly causes the need for infrastructure and the capital to increase. Jakarta's increasing population mobility also follows the rapid infrastructure growth, so the need for transportation and its supporting facilities is urgently needed. To fulfill the needs, the government often encounters various land-related obstacles due to the density of land for multiple functions, such as the difficulty of land acquisition and the high price of land. Various barriers caused by the increasingly rare and high land area on the surface made underground land more likely to be developed as a location for expanding public transportation, facility, and infrastructure to accommodate the needs of Jakarta citizens for mobility and connectivity. In procuring underground infrastructure, apart from physical problems and construction, the psychological aspects of user need spatial attention. This is related to the formation of human perception of the underground space. The underground is a new area that has not been explored optimally. Research on human psychological aspects related to the quality of the space has not been done much. Furthermore, the issue of female users' fear of crime related to safety and comfort also arises with the rapid physical development of transportation infrastructure in the capital. Referring to various studies, women and the elderly are more afraid of crime in a city. A National Commission on Violence Against Women for this data notes that sexual violence has occurred in Indonesia 20 times higher in the last 13 years, or more than 90,000 cases, and 23.7% occur in public spaces. Thus, studying the psychological aspect, comfort, and safety of underground transportation facilities, user is vital. Based on the literature st study, about 36% of public transportation users report feeling unsafe when using public transportation facilities. In addition, women commute more than men, and studies have found a different model choice by gender, where going on by public transport is more usual for women. However, although women more often use public transportation, the negative perception of this facility is quite strong. Furthermore, specific settings are considered scary and tend to be avoided, especially at night, as described by Jill Valentine, such as closed spaces with limited access, parking area in high-rise buildings, or underground passageways at terminal or station, and so on. Regarding on the statement before, it can be concluded that the underground space and the city as a closed public space with limited access has the urgency to be studied further. Unfortunately, the increasing construction of underground facilities is not along with awareness to consider the human factor. Sorry, I think this is the, like, yes, uh, wait, next. Next, next, next. Yes. Next. Next. Yeah. Okay, so, sorry. Um, yeah, discusses the level of user satisfaction with underground buildings to be low, causing negative perception to trigger emotional disturbances, such as feeling of being confined, leading to stress and depression, as described in the table. The condition of underground spaces that has the potential to cause negative psychological effects are a lack of sunlight, no outside view, underground locations have negative associations such as gray, as it collapse and cause claustrophobia. And uh, the last is uh, and undesirable indoor conditions, uh, no window, humidity. And then the condition of underground spaces that has the potential to cause negative psychological Physiological effects, uh, the same with lack of sunlight, high humidity levels, the lack of fresh air, the room ventilation system must be excellent and prone to indoor pollution caused by mineral composition and the road that composes it. Uh, to sum up, crime is not randomly distributed, but the physical condition of an environment can affect a person's feeling of safety and comfort, especially women. Therefore, it is crucial to study public facilities design based on gender to reduce women's fear of crime. 
So the objective of the study is to identify the relationship between female users' fear of crime in the underpass environment and identify environmental factors that dominate this fear. It is hoped that the result of this research can support government programs in the procurement of underground station that will support woman-friendly city in the future. This research was carried out in two stages of work with different methods. The first stage is data collection using the secondary research method, and the second stage uses the primary research method. The secondary research method involves data source from other parties, such as literature, scientific publication, journals, benchmarking, and articles from the internet. These are then analyzed and concluded in various aspects and used as independent variables in research. The primary research method is used after preliminary data has been collected through a surfing mean using the conclusions of the first stage as independent variables. Then these results are analyzed and concluded into specific contextual findings. Based on the first stage of analysis, referring to a journal entitled A Systematic Quality Assessment of Underground Spaces, a Public Transportation, fear can be triggered by the presence of other human roles or social aspects, or can also be triggered by the atmosphere of the built environment or spatial aspect. Therefore, it concluded that the social aspect, such as security officers, cleaners, station attendants, and so on, and informal or other users, and parts of the built environment, such as accessibility, feasibility, wayfinding, maintenance, are two significant aspects that become independent variables in this research. Within 14 days, the number of respondents to the questionnaire collected was 86 people, and all were female with a predominance of 20 years, uh, 22 years old in the age range 17 to 55 years old. The results stated that 60 out of 86 women who filled out the questionnaire experienced fear when walking through the underpass at Mangarai Station. Among them, 24 out of nine, uh, 39 people who had experienced a crime and 7 out of 10 victims of a criminal act were recorded to feel afraid when passing the underground passageway. It can be said that women who have experience with criminal acts, either directly or indirectly, impact the feelings of fear felt by the subject. Based on the survey results, respondents tend to feel a significant influence on fear through physical aspects of the built environment than social aspects. The result of the survey reinforced this statement. The first order is the lighting visibility with a vigor of 75%, followed by the infrastructure maintenance with 60% responses, then the dimensions of the long aisle and its cleanliness aspect have a value of 40%. In return, the social aspect is in last order along with the traces of vandalism with a vigor of 25%. In terms of visibility, uh, respondents were more, uh, sorry, were, uh, yeah, respondents were most afraid when their vision was disturbed. This is indicated by the results, which state that lighting intensity is the main point in influencing their fear of space when in the underground passageway. However, it is not only due to the lack of light intensity, but also influenced by a physical environment with a specific arrangement that can block the user's view. For example, an intersection in the main hallway of the underpass is not visible while walking in the aisle. These results are aligned with the former research that lighting is a crucial element that can affect women's feeling of security in the transit room. Uh, building maintenance is the second most significant aspect contributing to the fear of underpass users. 55% of respondents agree that the lack of maintenance of the physical environment of the underpass can affect the user's fear of crime. The underpass at Mangrai Station looks like it has half-finished material. It makes users feel afraid because it gives the impression of being unprepared for the facility at Mangarai Station to operate. The walls and floors that have been left uncoated make it look like an unfinished building. The conditions such as open drainage uh, located right next to the access to the main stairs 
causing others and giving the impression of being unhygienic and unsafe. And for spatial dimension and wife uh, wayfinding, um, it stated that the long and narrow hallway at Mangrai tends to cause users to feel afraid. However, uh, the feeling of fear in such space conditions can be minimized by the presence of clear signage. It is aligned with how the human brain works. To achieve their goals, humans rely on intuition and personal strategy. They also depend on the representation of the physical environment around them. If they cannot understand a space, they will feel confused and lost, causing discomfort and frustration. This can trigger panic and stress in an in an emergency because they feel insecure. And for the social aspect, respondents tend to feel afraid when they meet strangers under certain conditions, such as meeting a stranger in a group or individual who is silent or walking behind the respondent can trigger fear. And it, it, be, it is becomes um, worse uh, when it comes to night. And overall, there is a strong relationship between the physical aspect of the Mangara, Mangarai station passageway and the feelings of its users, primarily female users compared to the social aspects. Regarding the feasibility aspect, it is not only limited to the intensity of the lighting, but also includes not disturbing the user's view when walking on the aisle. The lighting at Mangarai underpass can be categorized as decent, although it is still more focused on the technical aspects. This shows that some areas can cause fear, especially in the supervision in these areas is not proper. For example, the underground tunnel has a configuration that forms a tunnel with a sharp bend to the platform as a potential area to hide. This research can be continued by exploring each aspect of the underpass as environmental cues that trigger fear, especially for female users. Through this study, I hope that the perception of fear of crime can be understood more broadly by various parties, such as designers, uh, policymakers, and managers of public facilities. Thus, various preventive measures can be taken to ensure women's sense of safety limited to underground passageway and at various public facility in the city. Okay. Here are some references that I used in this study. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Madam Levins, on the interesting studies on the impacts and the strong relationship between the physical aspects of, of the uh, underground transit public areas. Okay, I think this is a very good uh, awareness uh, talks to most of the, especially the designers as well as the policy makers and so forth. All right. Yeah. So uh, for all the participants, should you have any uh, questions? Please drop in the chat box. Okay, later on we will direct to the speakers. Okay, all right. So now we go into our last speakers of the first sessions today, Prof. Mohafiz Raas, who is the assistant professor from Schools of Architecture and Planning, Velo Institutes of Technology India. Prof. Mohafiz Riyas is registered architect under councils of architectures and associated members. Indian Institutes of Architects. He is currently pursuing PhD under MIT Velo Campus India. He has more than 10 years experience in both industries and teaching, as well as conducted various uh, trainings, workshops, and become the guest speakers at various institutions across the South India. So for today, he will talk about architectural form generations, conventional versus computational, and with this, I gave away this room to our third speakers of the session. So please welcome Professor Mohafiz Riyas. The room is yours. So thanks, thanks, Dr. Uh, PC. Yeah, and uh, hi, hi everyone. Actually, uh, when I received the poster from uh, UTM, I circulated that to my uh, friend and I asked him to attend. You know what he said? He said he's going for a movie. And <laughs> So thanks to all lovely people here who uh, prefer this talk over some entertainment. And uh, the speakers who came before me had uh, delivered very interesting and very engaging talk. And I hope I don't uh, break the chain off. Okay, all right. 
So coming to the topic, so uh, I'll share a PPT now. Okay, so is my uh, PPT visible, Dr. PC? Uh, yes, Prof, yeah, it's visible. Great. It's okay. in the presentation yeah. mode now, Great. yes. Thank you, thank you very much. So the topic is architectural form generation and uh, the difference between conventional and computational. Before going into the crux of this topic, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to show you a few images which will bring you some nostalgic moments. Take a look at this. So when we are in, when we are were asked to draw a house, this is exactly what most of us is attempted. Then we have this, a dog. You know, there is a common technique that we follow, at least in India, double five three, double five three, and you connect all the uh, uh, points, you get a sort of a dog. Then you have this one. Ah, this is, you know, a curvy linear V-shape, and we call that as a silhouette of birds, and we even call that as a bird drawing. And this is my uh, three-year-old sin drawing of a face, you know? He, uh, he said he's going to draw a face and he immediately, you know, put a bigger uh, polygon and within that polygon, you'll find five different holes, two for eyes, two for nostrils and one for mouth. What's happening here? So what's happening here is nothing but we have some ideas in our mind and we convert, we try to convert that ideas into signs. And we accepted, okay, that is a house, this is a face, this is a dog, this is a bird. That's because we believe in some standards and conventions. So we have ideas in your mind and when you bring it to uh, some topography on a paper that is communicated to a major audience who believed in some standards and conventions. What if I say, this is the same logic that underlies the concept of traditional drawing that we generally follow to make buildings. So this, what you see on the right, is a plan of a country brick house by Mies, and what you see on the right is a drawings of Palladian architecture, you know, Villa de Tunda. Here, you know, drawings, have always been architects medium to express ideas, not just to express ideas, but also to categorize spaces, resources and whatnot. But as the drawings evolve, as the technology evolved over period, for example, you have in the Renaissance, there was a, a invention of perspective. During your modern times, there was invention of your uh, 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 projective geometries. So these as, influenced in the way we perceive and conceive the spaces. But this drawing, this conventional drawing has got certain limits. What are those limits? It is an additive process. Generally, you take a building, a building is a complex exercise. So what happens here is we, we try to reach the complexity by adding layers of layers of uh, information on or about the other. There is no associative relationship between these informations. The problem is, like, like I said, uh, you know, where your uh, uh, childhood drawings, this is also not a smart media, but generally this is based on certain standards and conventions. So what is the problem here? The limits of conventional drawing is, it totally differs from your cognitive mechanism. So whenever there is a creative process happening in our mind to, to design a building or to design a product, generally it depends on interrelationship between some contents. And that is how a creative process gets ignited in our mind. That is completely contradicts with an additive process that underlies with the conventional drawing. The second main limit is you have, you, when you have a conventional drawing, the drawing is not smart, the medium is not smart, so you exclude real world forces. For example, you, you cannot uh, uh, simulate or you cannot uh, uh, predict the outcomes of gravity or any other forces through conventional drawing. So these limits, irrespective of these limitations, 
we have been following, we have been successfully using this medium. What happens here is this has made a typology. So there are architects who created typology of buildings, which is totally born out of a concept where you have a certain restrictions, you have a specific uh, uh, set of restrictions and proven solutions, which underlies the concept, this, this designs of these typologies. So you have FL right who comes into this typology. You have a uh, uh, Mies, Barcelona Pavilion, Lee Corp. You have Palladian architecture, again, Lee Corp. So you have uh, mm, this guy, uh, what's his name? Yeah, Robert Venturi. So Venturi will look. So these typologies are born out of a proven solutions. And hence you will find these typologies are nothing but refinement of variations that are limited by certain certain limits, certain limits and certain constraints. And the parallelly, there was also another generation of architects, another group of architects who attacked this conventional drawing because of these limitations, who believed on natural formation of forms. And you will find our Gaudi's catenary, Isler's suspension of uh, fabrics. Then you have uh, a famous Friotto San experiment, and you have your uh, bubble, uh, soap bubble experiment by Friotto. What happens here? Since you realize, since you wanted to inspire from a natural formation of a, a natural way of forming a geometry, you cannot rely on conventional drawing. To, to, to extrapolate these forms. So you have to rely on these kind of physical experiments. So there is a shift to analog apparatus from a conventional drawing. There are certain generation of architects who shift to these kind of practices to generate or to extrapolate forms. This you will find immediately when you see their typology, that typology will be so different from the previous typology that I showed you. This typology does not reflect any static amalgamation of primitive geometries. Okay, this has got dynamic forms. This has got some movement into it. Okay, but there is a problem here. When you rely on these physical models, you only tend to take advantage of gravity. Yeah, monoparametric. This is monoparametric. But undoubtedly, this exercises, this shift to analog apparatus has marked a trajectory towards a multi-parametric approach, which we currently call it as a computational process. So there is a conventional process that, that is totally built based on additive concept of traditional drawing, and there is a computational process which works on, works on associative relationship, relationship. So when you have this analog apparatus as a monoparametric, there is a very important experiment in history. There is important, very important research by Moretti, Italian architect. He experimented on parameters and he identified the dimensions, the, design, the dimensions are nothing but connect to different parameters. And when you manipulate these parameters, that is that will give you that will give you varieties of iterations of forms. For example, take a look at this is this is a model that he submitted that he presented as part of his research where he was designing a stadium of so, I mean a stadium soccer stadium where the design parameters are not or were linked to viewing angles and economic feasibility. So the final shape were generated by calculating the ISO curves that attempted to optimize the views. So you will find it's no more a concentric circle. It's no more a rectangular, uh, offsetted rectangular. The form slowly tends to change when you try to involve or, or when you try to change the tool that you use to design the particular object. So going further, and this was his conclusion. This was his conclusion by Moretti. And from this quote, it is very evident Moretti immediately understood the potentials of computer applied to design. And immediately after two years, there was an, another guy, Ivan Sutherland, who 
invented this interface called Sketchpad interface. What happens is though this interface features much of uh, uh, current CAD provisions, current CAD operations like uh, zoom in block or uh, mirror, but this is based on an associative relationship. I'll tell you what is an associative relationship. It's very simple. You have a point A, if you have a point A and two lines, more appropriately two vectors attached to the point A and you change the position of these point that will in turn will change the direction and magnitude of these two vectors. Okay, so all the parameters are interlinked here. So that was a wonderful contribution by Ivan Sutherland to what we currently practicing, not we currently, there is a separate journal in architecture, you know, right now it is getting familiarized computational architecture. So though this was invented in 1963, almost two decades, there was a revel of AutoCAD, our commercial software, but that didn't work on this associative relationship. AutoCAD, what happened is AutoCAD just, you know, fasten the repetitive tasks that we, we do on a manual board. It is, it is basically digitalized the manual board. But the software which came five years later, which is Pro Engineer 1987, which is a software to design mechanical uh, systems that worked on associative geometries. For example, if you have a rivet and if you have a, a relevant hole, if you change the dimensions of this rivet, the, the hole will also get manipulated simultaneously. And eventually we'll find many academic researchers and avant-garde practices have tried to manipulate these softwares and take advantage of these software potentials to create complexity Beyond, beyond human limitations. So what is a computational process? So you have a geometrical association, you have a geometry, and how do you create an association? You can, you can only create a link through a parameters. Okay, so now you have to link these parameters, link these parameters, how do you do? Okay, these parameters are lying on your computer screen. So you do a scripting, you do a scripting to link these parameters. So that scripting is called as algorithm. So you will find in, the, in computation architecture, there are other terms like uh, parametric ar architecture, algorithmic architecture, which eventually denotes to one particular genre of practice. Okay, when you relay, when you try to design something, taking advantage of that associative relations of, uh, relationship of the geometry, that comes under this Q genre called computational process. I'll show you with a very simple example, what I explained before, I'll show you with a very simple example. This is from a book called Algorithms Aided Design. What you see here, for example, you have a cylinder. You know, you, you conceive the cylinder as fragmented uh, 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 parts. So you have many circles, interim circles, and those circles at various points based on your uh, suggestion or divided, and you connect those divisions through a line. What happens if I change radius of one circle? It is creating an another form. Okay, this is only possible when you connect these parameters, when the geometries work on associative logic. What happens if I change the circle, the radius of all the circle? You have a, another iterated form that is born out of a cylinder. So here we are only talking about manipulating the radius of a circle, but there are multitude of parameters here. You have lines, you have, uh, uh, you know, divisions, you have varieties of nodes, and not just by changing, you can change the operation that you, uh, uh, that you suggest to the geometry, you can change the orientation, you can change the scale, you know? So by, 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 by just pulling out or by, by just te teasing the parameter point on the surface of the cylinder, the entire topology, the entire uh, topology of the cylinder changes. So the iterate, iterative possibilities are numerous when you work on these basis, when you create form based on this linked logic. Now you will find this kind of changing the tool or changing the process have given rise to another genre of architecture, another style of buildings. You'll find Frangeri, Zahadid, have Greglin, there's a famous experimental project by Greglin Blobwall. We have our Indian architect Sami Padora. 
and this is by IBA uh, uh, Tower in China. Then you have your uh, ICD Stuttgart Laboratory Project. This is like a Woodbuga Pavilion. It's in Germany. So what happens here is these typologies, these uh, 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 structures are only possible when you rely your design process on a logic which works on associative relationship, not on an additive process. So going further, in my talk, I have mentioned this form making and form finding, though these two words looks like identical twins, but there is an intuitive difference between these two words. What are they? So form making, form making is nothing but when you, when the form proceeds, when you assume the form before analysis, okay, before, uh, before analysis or before evaluating the contextual challenges, but form find comes after the analysis, you go to a site or you understand a context and then you provide something. A pro it could be a product or it could be an architectural uh, solution. When a form emerges from an analysis, that is form finding. So what is the necessity of this craft? You could be asking. There is a very interesting statement by uh, Lyserin in a, in a very famous conference called What Matters. He, he proposed this, uh, the statement, what I'm going to tell he proposed. He said, extreme of form making is not architecture, but sculpture. An extreme of form finding is also not architecture, but applied engineering. Okay, so I feel, I feel architecture has to be rooted in a perfect equilibrium of form making and form finding. Generally, nowadays you will find there are a lot of softwares that promote this kind of computational design practices. You have Grasshopper, for Autodesk Revit, you have a, a Dynamo. Then there is a Gerris Technology Digital Project. Then you also by Bentley, you have got uh, another interface, it's called as Generative Components. So there are a lot of uh, softwares. Sadly, when students practice on the softwares, they create some curvilinear shapes or take, they create some amorphous forms just because they look fancy. They look something different from what is existing. But understanding the logic, understanding the context is very important. They should not, at the end, they should not creating a sculpture. At the end, they should not be doing something which is similar to a boat or a car, applied engineering. Uh, th this should be rooted to a perfect equilibrium of form finding and form making, okay? So now we have discussed about the design process. So now we have designed a building. Now from making this design to a realization, there is another, that, that's in another world. There is another set of challenges that you need to consider. There is another set of possibilities that you need to take advantage of that very primarily hinges on these three parameters, materiality, mission parameter and finally assemble assemblage of your fabricated components so materiality so this kind of this type of substantive design is totally totally based on understanding the tangible properties of material like you have dimensional properties you have deformation you need to understand the durability of the material the relative cost the finish uh, finish texture what not? So there are a lot of, the, the architect has to understand the material. The material has to be integrated at the design stage. You cannot choose the material after the design. So the reason is everything is linked because every material has got a limitations. You can only, if, if, if for example, if you want to curve something, okay, it totally depends on the, uh, the material logic of, the cho of your chosen material. Then it comes to your machine parameter. That now you have your high-tech uh, uh, cons uh, constructability. You have a uh, seven axis uh, robots, robotic fabrication. You have a uh, CNC modeling. You have a uh, 3D printing, uh, drones coming into construction, a lot of things. Each machine, these machines have got different behavior to your chosen material. So these things are linked, okay? And there is an assembly. Once, you, okay, these panels are fabricated. The elements are fabricated. Now we have to bring into the site. We have to assemble it. The assemblage itself is a another process here. For example, what you see here on the third image from your 
uh, uh, left top. That is a ICD pavilion. That's, that's a pavilion by ICD structure. Here, you know, these plywood panels are connected through a custom fabricated joint, and not just a custom fabricated joint. Those are supported by their self weight. So there is an assembly. Assembly also becomes part of your design parameter. You take this fourth image, uh, which is your Dunescape Pavilion in New York, which was constructed 2000. And this uh, pavilion, uh, the uh, ICD Pavilion was constructed 2010. So 10 years before this Dunescape Pavilion was constructed, you will find though there, are, there is a dynamism involved in the process, there is, though there is a movement that is involved in the interiors, but you will be able to see the sharp connection between the panels. Sharp connection between the panels. What happens is this is 10 years before. This is like uh, uh, 10 years before, the, before this uh, ICT pavilion. Here, and this word pavilion was also constructed uh, with unskilled neighbors. I think students of architecture were involved in this kind of assembly. So you will find, you will be able to see a, a, a sharp connection between these panels. Okay, so when you integrate, when you involve materiality, the machine parameter assembly into the design stage, you could avoid such, you know, you could not avoid, you could, you could enhance or you could bring down extremely beautiful and dynamic forms that is not possible to envision using your conventional drawing. Does it have limitations? Yes, it has got many limitations. And one such limitation is material optimization. Say, I'm having a curvilinear facade. So I'm planning a gla glazing or even a metal cladding for the curvilinear facade. Every panel is going to have a different orientation, different size and different shape. And that is going to create a lot of wastage of materials when you want to customize each and every, uh, every panel that is going to uh, lead to a lot of wastage. And how do you avoid it? For example, there are a lot of process like genetic algorithm, there are a lot of computational process that optimize the material usage to construct these kind of forms. So that ensures that you have a parental material, uh, which could be a glass, for example, eight feet by four feet. Um, that is your, uh, uh, you know, original size. So the cut or the customization that you're going to do for this panel doesn't deviate much from this parental set. So the, like this, you will have these different kinds of uh, optimizing methods that would ensure uh, that would ensure the material is used optim optimally and this in, in, in realizing these kind of buildings. Um, this is my hypothesis for the research which I'm currently involved in, where, you know, now I'm targeting at the assembly, assembly part of this kind of uh, practice. So you have a connection details. What happens if you involve connection details as an integrated and intuitive component, as an as a inter, inter, uh, intuitive design parameter in the design process itself? And how it is going to optimize the form finding of wooden pavilion structure is what the current hypothesis, the current research I'm involved in. And anybody who would love to contribute to this, anybody who would love to uh, uh, work with me on this are Mostly welcome. And finally, this one. You know, undoubtedly, undoubtedly, we all strive to create a better world for humanity. And it's pointless to have a better world outside if you don't have a happy world inside. Look at this poem, and don't worry, I'm not going to read this, but take a look at these highlighted words. These highlighted words talks about your uh, simple gestures that you normally extend to a stranger. Right? If you believe, if you believe great love lies in this kind of simple gestures, spread it, spread that love shamelessly, sincerely, and significantly. Thanks for the opportunity. All right, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Mohafiz, for the interesting thoughts uh, on the architecture form generations. Okay. So I think um, now we have ended with our third speakers. So I will try to open up the Q&A sessions to all the um, audience over here. Okay. All right. So I'm trying to look into the chat box. 
Okay, so we have, um, are you ready? Uh, Prof. Pradipa, Madam Nevin, and Prof. Mohafiz. I have a few questions uh, in the chat box uh, here. So from Dr. Alice, okay, to uh, Prof. Pradipa. In designing the auditorium or closed space acoustic play an important role, but are there any other aspect that need to take into account? Okay, this is for Prof. Pradipa. Would you like to uh, respond first, Prof? Is Prof. Pradipa here? Or probably I can move to the other question first. All right. So the other one is to Madam Nevin. Okay, Madam Nevin. Okay, Um. yeah. What is your suggestions for best solutions for women design in public space? Does women from different culture play a role also? Okay, Madam Nevin. Would you like to answer uh, this first? Uh, okay, thank you for the question. So right. the, uh, the best solution um, for uh, this uh, this case uh, for uh, because um, so I take the case in in Indonesia right now um, for for uh, women uh, and actually before I mentioned about women elderly and actually uh, also for children so. When when we when we as designer think uh, are put more focus in uh, gender design uh, or I can say inclusive design so we can call, include the elderly and children that um, the design will be uh, design design and proper for the other uh, users such as. Like uh, because women, we have a lot of um, what to say. We have a lot of requirements when we are traveling al alone, uh, especially in in Indonesia, um, where at some areas a lot of crime uh, happen in some areas, such as in slum area as well, um, and mostly happen at night, and then kind of. Uh, violence is not only um, physical, but also verbally. It still happen uh, right now. So yeah, we we have to do the further study in this in this aspect. So not only thinking about the technical issue, but also the psychological aspect, uh, such as yeah, um, the the uh, how to manage the built environment very safe for women. Uh, to understand what women's need uh, and also elderly need and also the children's needs in the city, uh, we can, uh, yeah, by understanding their need, we also can try to provide, uh, provide it uh, by design. And then, yeah, such as for women needs, uh, we are, uh, when, when we travel with kids and then, or only by ourselves and, or when we are in, uh, Pregnant, yeah, we have different needs. So yeah, uh, for the uh, for the first stage, we have to understand uh, these these users' needs first, whether it's uh, psychologically or physically, and then as a designer, we have to turn that into the design. Uh, let's say uh, in the when when uh, there is the lev different level, we have to accommodate with. Uh, Elevator or escalator, so the woman with a pregnant a pregnant woman can travel easily, or maybe um, such as um, a breastfeeding woman. Uh, I I did the research also about breastfeeding woman in the city, uh, and uh, like a lactation room, we can provide it. Oh well, so yeah, we start with understanding their needs first, and then we translate into the design that can fulfill their needs. Yes, exactly. Thank you very much, Madam Levins, for the answers. Yeah, um, perhaps we can move into the next questions. Okay, uh, so for next question, um, for Prof. Mohafiz. Okay, Prof. 
in teaching students on design to your perception is using sketching better or using computational method is much better. As many of you saying that using the sketch will much better test the imaginative thinking of the students. So what's your opinion regarding to this, Prof? So you're asking my opinion. Yeah, See, prof. Drawing, drawing is a very important tool for architect. Okay, you need to understand the alphabets before writing an essay. Exactly. And you cannot directly start writing an essay. So what, those, what are those alphabets? What are the roots? You need to have a strong roots. And you need, and parallelly, you, need to, you also need to understand what is the symbiotic link between the tool that you use and the building or the design that you create. And that was the objective of the talk that I, uh, I gave. So you cannot negate the importance of drawing in, uh, in, in uh, lower architecture studios. That is important. But parallelly, parallelly, you also need to have inculcation of digital tools that I find it's missing. So that's my opinion on this, uh, Professor DC. Okay, I think that is somehow uh, rele relevant because uh, both, I think in the advancements of the technology nowadays, the tools itself could help us out in order to make the whole process more comprehensively. Yeah, for sure we have to, uh, for sure, before you're trying to fly, you have to know how to walk first. That is somehow <laughs> that we're always trying to say is right. Yeah, so yeah, that is somehow that I think, thank you very much uh, from Prof Mahafiz. Okay, we have uh, another question uh, from to, yeah, same things for Prof Mohafiz as well. <laughs> for architect, what is the best approach to come out for the form development? And in this sense, how does the dictum form follows the function come to the place? Okay, so th this is precisely why I brought these two words, form finding and form making. So it's not you make the form and you fit the functions to it. You understand how the forces, the forces could be heterogeneous. Forces are generally heterogeneous in a building. You have a gravity, you have social forces, you have uh, users and whatnot. You have a uh, material. So there are a lot of forces, heterogeneous forces. You need to understand how these forces are going to affect the form. And that will lead you to some uh, for a process called form finding. Okay, so when you make a form and try to fit the function to it, that is more like a sculptural exercise. But when you let these forces affect your form, eventually making the form more dynamic, more spectacular, and um, that is a form finding. An extreme of this form finding is applied engineering. You cannot have a car, you cannot uh, create a, a boat, right? So. Uh, this one, uh, you have to find a stable uh, equilibrium between form making and form finding. And that is, in my opinion, I think the architecture is rooted in that particular position. Okay. All right. And uh, previously, previously, you will find previously, there are the, uh, uh, you know, these tools, these com uh, computer digital tools were used to create forms, and then the functions were made to fo force to fit into it. And the forms were generally made that time to uh, just for the novel, uh, just for the novel purposes. And now I think there is a lot of awareness into it. So how do we have the authority of architecture into it? Now there are a lot of awareness and uh, the reason built forms, the reason architectural uh, uh, examples are reflecting these awarenesses. Yes, agree. Agree with you, Prof, on this. Okay, I think we have a few questions from um, Prof as well, okay, Prof uh, Mohafiz. Yeah, is it possible to include the human behavior effects on the computational design of form? Can you suggest some references? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the, the image that I showed you as part of the PPT, it was a Dunescape Pavilion constructed 2000, uh, uh, considering the year 2000 in New York, is a good example how you could inculcate human performance because you will find the interior of the uh, of the pavilion was, was 
was, was born out of anthropometrical process, anthropometrical dimensions of different postures that you normally find in a beach, sitting, sleeping, you know, relaxing, all those things. So the, the anthropometrical pattern of different postures were involved, were involved in making the geometry, the pattern of interior of dunescape. Do you understand? So uh, there are a lot more examples which now I, I couldn't think of, but Dunescape is a very good example for it. Where you find the human behavior, behavior of human is inculcated in the design process and that led to the, uh, the formation of uh, the uh, forms. There is a one more example, there is one more uh, design, I, I, for, I forgot the uh, project name, but it was by an architect called uh, Greg Lane. Where what happened is he simulated, it is an urban scale project. I think it's a metro station or something where he simulated, simulated the movement of people on a plaza or on the, on, on the pathway. And he, and he, he, he considered that one as a primary force to determine the form of the metro uh, building. Okay, so how people move around the plaza. Are they going straight? Are they get, taking a turn? What are the different movements? So this was simulated using a software called Wavefront simulation or something, Wavefront software or something. And that one was used as an underlying pattern to create those forms. So likewise, you will have many examples where uh, the human behaviors were involved in making these forms at inherent level. Okay, thanks for the references, um, yeah, Prof. I think probably later on, if you are free, probably you can try to type in the chat box uh, for, for the audience to refer. Okay, we have um, yeah, another questions. Okay, also for uh, Prof Mohafiz. Okay, I think this topic is very popular. Uh, um, okay, um, sorry, let me try to find. Okay, can you share your opinions on implementing the computer added architectural design for lower years of architecture students? I think this is a very straightforward question uh, regarding this to the... Okay. Could you I, please repeat this question? Yeah, sure, sure. Can you share your opinions on implementing computer-added architecture design for lower years architecture students? The opinions of implementing uh, CAD. Can we, yeah, we can say that it's CAD design for the lower years students. Or do you think that it should be manual? Yeah. Yeah, it should be, but before that, before that, we need to understand what is the purpose of using the tool. It is not just about know-how, it is also about why. Why do we do that? So if you, if you don't know how to use a particular tool, why you are using the particular tool, there is no point. So that's what, um, again, coming to that point, form making versus form finding, and these awarenesses has to be brought to the students before you give these tools to, or to the, or on their hand. Okay, all right. I hope that it answers um, your, your questions, okay, from the audience. Yeah, we have a um, few questions over here. I think we still have time. Uh, yeah. Is computational gener generated architecture applicable largely only on grand scale public spaces? What is your take on applying this to the smaller or the personal spaces, cost versus ideations? I think this question is directed to uh, Madam Nevin. Am I right? Okay. Me? Is yes. That yes. Sorry. Yeah. It, yeah. Is it's computational generated architecture uh, applicable largely on grand scales public spaces? What is your take on applying this to the smaller personal space? Oh, I, I think, think this is for all yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. Got it. Okay. Sorry so, about that. Yeah. Okay. Forget about large spaces, even indoor spaces, there are even product design which are made, which are relayed on these computation. For example, uh, there is a, there was a, a very interesting workshop that I attended where uh, there was a person from Korea who was teaching me, how do you design a shoe using these tools? Yeah, how do you design a mask using this? What happens is generally these computations will give you pool of iterations and we call that as a generative process. So when you have this range of possibilities and you have many possible possibilities before you, you can choose which one is optimal 
in terms of material wastage, in terms of uh, uh, contextual relevance, in terms of cost. Okay, so just because a form looks really great and it is also parallelly contextually relevant, but it doesn't coincide with the cost that you have, budget that you have, you reject that typology, you reject that particular iteration, you go for the other one. So likewise, you know, when you have, it's like choosing between possibilities. Yeah. All right. Okay, we have a few more questions. Okay, also for Prof. Mahafiz on this. Uh, later on, we have one question for Madam uh, Nevin and Prof. Pradipa. Uh, yeah, for Prof. Mahafiz, how AI plays a major role in today's digital world in terms of spatial planning? Okay, I got it. So, I went to uh, this Dubai Expo 2020. All the installations, all the pavilions there are really advanced. You have interactive technologies everywhere. Yeah. And, and in order to, you know, make these forms, that is the, the, the uh, subsequent step, I would say, that is called as a liquid architecture, where you have interactive panels, where architects come in, where the space communicates with you, the AI comes into picture. So that is at the behavioral scale. If you ask me the construction scale, robotics. So you need to have a clear script to make these robots do the job. So without artificial intelligence, this computation is also developed because of tremendous technological advancements in artificial intelligence. Okay, so you have softwares. The Grasshopper plugin that came for Rhinoceros five years before, six years before was, now, nowadays it's much different. You have many plugins to it. You have many tools under that particular uh, uh, software. Okay, so advancements are coming. Again, it is completely on uh, the architect's decision or the designer's decision to understand the contextual, contextual relevance. Why do we do that? That is also there. And uh, uh, projects by uh, Herzog de Muron, you have uh, 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 you, uh, Riser and Umemoto. So if you see installations of these architects, completely relied on artificial intelligence that would enhance the behavior of the spaces. And there are a lot more examples. There is a, a cloud cloud building, I think cloud building, uh, which where it creates a smoke and that smoke is, you know, I don't want to elaborate it. You can take a look at this particular example to understand how AI is infused in this kind of practices. Okay, yes. and one more thing, there was also, uh, uh, you know, uh, we have uh, Neri Oxmon, who currently heads uh, MIT lab, MIT media lab, who works on intersection of uh, architecture, biology, and technology. Okay, and undoubtedly you will find, you will find uh, uh, there is a, uh, it, it's a proven fact that there is a symbiosis between the form and its behavior. In nature, in nature I'm talking about, you take a leaf, it is a direct link, be link between the shape of the leaf and the performance that you that the leaf generally perform. And we are slowly moving towards an era where we are trying to learn from nature and trying to convert that into technology. So when you learn from nature, you, we also need to be equipped with different tools, different facilities that would enable us to create curvilinear shapes. Because in nature you will find mostly curvilinear shapes. There are no like rectilinear shapes, okay? And it's high time we need to uh, include, include these uh, advanced design process into it. Thank you. Yes, exactly. I think, yeah, this is a very insightful kinds of the explanations, okay, from Prof. Mohafiz. Okay, I hope the, uh, the answers, um, answers the questions of the audience. Okay, for now we have another question for Madam uh, Nevins. Okay, to consider another perspective for the benefits of marginal people. Have you ever researched on any public facilities for them? It seems to be a new urban vernacular. Yeah, Madam Nevin. Okay, uh, I'll try to answer. Um, so actually I never done the research for marginal people before, but I have uh, uh, engaged into a community engagement for them. Uh, so it, it was in 2016 or 17, I forgot. So how uh, me and my team uh, making um, 
like a um, educational space for them. And uh, we call it rumah susun, or it's not apartment, but you know uh, the 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 house uh, the house from the government for uh, the marginal people. So yeah, I, uh, we are trying to find a solution for them because in we believe that uh, in every uh, different users they have different uh, um, perception and also needs such as this uh, community uh, and the the how they live their daily life is also different uh, with the other community so yeah based on that uh, activities um, uh, to 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 produce a space for them uh, we we did uh, like a focus group discussion before we uh, build the space for them. So through uh, from that MGD, we concluded that uh, what actually uh, their needs for the space for the like we call it uh, um, not educational space, uh, but it's uh, a play space, but um process of uh, education activity and something like that that um, they can uh, engage into the activity as well so yeah we try to research on uh, their needs and also their behavior uh, and about their perception of their space and also how they live their daily life and then from that from that uh, uh, study then uh, we translate into a space. All right. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Madam Nevins, for for the process to explaining about the process uh, to designing for the marginal peoples. Okay. I think that is uh, should be very interesting. Hopefully, next time we are able to hear from you regarding to this topic. Okay. Yeah. Another questions also for Prof. Mohafiz. Okay, Prof. In what stage does the design process is most critical in parametric? Is it efficient from the initial or ideations or later during the detailed design only? Yeah, Pro. Okay. Okay. So uh, what happens is the these digital tools generally offers you a, a world to conceive a virtual world basically to conceive objects or to conceive forms which are beyond human limitations. Okay. So but what is the starting point and what is the core of the idea you have to ideate and, and to, to communicate if you have many people around you, now you cannot sketch it on a sheet of paper and say this form looks that side this way and there is a fluidity in this way. So for that, you have to make conceptual uh, diagrams. You have to rely on these tools to make conceptual diagrams on digital screens. Okay, so this is basically to you have something in your mind. Only you have only have that nucleus, you will be able to bring that into a virtual world. But to communicate, it cannot be communicated through a conventional drawing. It cannot be communicated through words. So you need to have a conceptual model using this technology. And only when you communicate these intricacies of the complex geometry that you create, then the design development happens. Advanced design development happens. That comes afterwards. So why do you use that is also my answer. Okay, it is not about any stage you can you could use, it depends on the complexity of the challenge. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. Thank you, Prof, for the explanations on that. Um, yeah. Shall we have Prof Pradipa? Okay, there's one question to Prof Pradipa. Um, Prof. In designing auditorium or closed space, acoustic plays an important role, but are there any other aspects that need to be taken into account? If Prof Pradipa is here. Could you please repeat the link? All right, sure, Prof. Okay, Prof, the question sounds, uh, in designing auditorium or closed space, acoustic play an important role. But are there any other aspect that need to take into account? Okay, 
In designing auditorium or closed space, acoustic play an important role. But are there any other aspects that need to be taken into account? Prof, can you get the question? Um, I'll link the question in the chat box so I can okay. see that I did it. All right, sure, sure, Prof. Okay. Um, yeah, moment, please. The design of the auditorium plays an important role. Next, what is it? Is there any other aspect that need to take into account? Yeah, Prof. Is there any that need? Okay, Prof. I uh, have posted in the chat box. Need to be taken into account. Yes. Yeah. See, designing of auditorium plays. Uh, other aspects is whatever the parameters I have explained, uh, like reverberation time, definition, pitch transmission. Uh, and later fraction. These are the other parameters which is apart from the reverberation time you have to consider for designing of an auditorium or multi-purpose hall. So all these parameters you have an instrument for calculating reverberation time. The reverberation time is an instrument which also gives this speed transmission index value also. But for calculating for the other parameters like the clarity and the definitions you can go only with the simulation model. But uh, there are two uh, instruments which are input to account uh, to calculate value also. But other parameters you can go only for the simulation model. And based on this simulation model and also testing and training of the other auditorium, we can also go for the machine learning algorithm by using neural network analysis procedure. So while you go for this neural network analysis procedure, after testing and training of the uh, number of several auditoriums, like 150 or 200 auditoriums, so when we go for the procedure, that is a machine learning algorithm, the parameter value could be calculated before the designing process itself. So these are other parameters, apart from the reaction time as a main parameter, there are other parameters like definition, clarity, strength, speech, index, which plays a major role for designing of the uh, auditorium. And for the, these are the parameters, other aspects is, as I told, the defects of the auditorium, like the background noise, the uh, echo, so all these have to be uh, avoided for designing of the auditorium. And as I said in the previous slide, how I explained about the uh, site considerations and then uh, the standards to be followed. So all these aspects you have to take into account uh, for uh, uh, other aspects for the better clarity and speech intensity in the end. All right. Thank you, Prof, for the explanations. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, for the simulations purpose, it, the parameters is very important for us to um, take into account. So when we trying to design and enclose spaces for the acoustic design, yeah, that would be perhaps I think um, could be referred to some of the parameters as well as the uh, the designs of uh, yeah options that we can look into that, for example, like the context and so forth. All right. I think, yeah, that's about that. Is there any other questions from the audience? Okay, probably you could switch on your uh, mic, okay, and talk verbally uh, and or ask verbally. Okay, maybe, yeah, you can uh, post your questions again later on. Yeah, we, we have another sessions. All right, yeah, if there's no other questions, I think now let's all the... Uh, audience, can you switch on your camera? So now we are going to have the first sessions of the uh, photo snapping sessions. Yeah. Before we continue on our second sessions. So all the audience, do you mind to switch on your camera? All right. So it's like a break session, huh? since this is not a physical session. So yeah, probably photo taking might wait. Um, you mind uh, all of us out because since this is afternoon, right? <laughs> okay, are you ready? Okay, one, two, three. Okay, we have few pages here, so I shall take another shot. So next screen. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, all right, yeah. Okay, now um, let us resume uh, our sessions two of the webinar today. So we have our speaker number four from University Technology Malaysia. We have Associate Professor Dr. Karu Anwar. 
from architecture program, faculty of built environment and surveying. So Associate Professor Dr. Karu Anwar is the head of the Design Process Practice and Management, or we call DPROM Research Group, Faculty of Built Environment and Surveying UTM. He is the professional members of Architects Registration Board, ARB, United Kingdom, and immediate past Deputy Director 1 of Institute Sultan Iskandar, UTM. He has involved in multiple professional and consultancy projects and experience in administrations, architectural education, accreditation panelists, and international levels committee members. So for today's webinar, he will talk about shaping sustainability, a design imperative. And with this, I gave away this room to our fourth speakers of the day. Please welcome Associate Professor Dr. Kairuano. Doctor, the room is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. PC. Uh, let me just share, sorry. I hope you're seeing this, uh, all, all the audience, yeah? Uh, yes. First of all, yeah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good uh, late afternoon for everyone. Um, and my name is uh, Kairul Anwar, Muhammad Kaidze, uh, and I'll be uh, talking about a topic uh, uh, named Shaping Sustainability a Design Imperative. All right. Okay. Um, uh, this is a top. This is a topic that probably most of you are uh, have heard of uh, and probably are aware of. Uh, but uh, I gather that uh, um, many of us, uh, most probably most of us, are actually uh, uh, require will re require a deeper understanding of what uh, sustainability and sustainable development entails. It has become the word has become uh, rather ubiquitous. Uh, the word sustainability and sustainable development. To the extent that uh, perhaps people are freely using these words, uh, and perhaps with with uh, with uh, uh, rather lacking of knowledge or understanding uh, uh, about about what it entails and the implications of of, of this uh, uh, what we call I would I would, I would call it as, as phenomenon. You know, it's a phenomenon, uh, sustainability, right? Um, we have many references for for SD uh, sustainable development or sustainability, but by the way, there are there are two different uh, meanings. Yeah. Uh, uh, they, they they conjure uh, two different meanings. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, actually elaborate on that because they, they are being uh, these are these top, such topics are being discussed quite in detail in 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 uh, a lot of journals and literature. So uh, going back to the idea uh, definition uh, references of uh, of SD, uh, uh, one of the uh, leading definition is about uh, development that meets the needs for current generation without compromising the ability. For future generations to meet their needs and aspirations, right? And then we have uh, um, uh, another definition that actually advocates maximizing net profits and sorry, net benefits of economic development. The word net is being used quite widely, uh, and there is some some knowledge references on the word net actually, right? Uh, and also, um, uh, uh, it is a development that is uh, slated to improve the quality of human life while living within the caring capacity of supporting ecosystems, right? We also have uh, sustainable development as a sum of actions, decisions and innovations to the improvement of quality of human life within the capacity of our supporting ecosystems. Uh, and then when we when we talk about SDGs, uh, I think this is something that probably uh, many of us will increasingly be involved with, especially in research. Uh, and uh, in in uh, design tasks uh, and what have you, uh, which is uh, uh, SDG means uh, Sustainable Development Goals, uh, and the, the 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 leading one uh, goes up to seventeen. You have S SD seventeen SDGs uh, goals uh, uh, to actually to actually uh, comprehend and actually take action on. All right. So it is it is uh, it is meant to actually hold a broad perspective of the term and bring uh, several domains together to achieve sustainability. That's what. They say, you know, and and um, uh, and uh, these are meant to actually uh, uh, to actually uh, involve a, a greater community, uh, uh, which means that it, it go cross inter cross disciplinary interdisciplinary. Uh, uh, it it goes as a perspective to, in order to understand to understand the interactions and interdependencies between social, environmental, economic issues, and these are the three cues: social, environmental, and economic. Uh, and then, uh, well, anyway, uh, uh, we, we could go on, 
but nevertheless i think i think the concept it is still still actually uh uh in in, in the midst of evolving as a concept and 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 you know uh, and it therefore it conjures uh, further debate continuous debate and study right uh this is one of one of my favorite uh, uh visualization of sd uh, sd or assessment development or sustainability for that matter because uh, because uh, um because it does it, it does give a, a, a general grounding on, on what we are talking about uh, you see you see uh, many uh, parties uh, trying to uh, visualize uh, sustainable development so so the most uh, uh, the, the latest and probably the most uh, amenable to, to uh, of all the uh, visuals that we have or diagrams that we have is perhaps the one in the last one which is a uh, which is the classic dimension of sustainability uh, and this is something that is promoted by uh, by writers by researchers like Tangui, you know uh, uh, and and the fact that uh, let me just uh, bring you to note the fact that um, you have social and economic environmental uh, existing in their in their bubbles but they are overlapped by 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 uh, performance performance indicators which is livability livable uh, that is between social and environmental and then you have uh, 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 viability uh, where you combine the economic and environmental uh, uh, together uh, in, in, in certain initiative, uh, while social economic uh, factors, uh, uh, they, they are usually um, resort to measures of equity or equitable. You know? so, so this is something that I think uh, uh, we need to take note of because otherwise uh, uh, it, it is the in-between spaces, the interfaces between, between these three these three parameters uh, social economic environmental okay uh, i guess you might be asking how relevant will this be uh, to to design and, and architecture uh, mm -hmm. in particular all right uh, this is this is how how uh, uh, this is how the united nations and how uh, how various authorities throughout the world uh, would like to envisage uh, uh, when they 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 are, they are being being uh, uh, considered as acting upon sustainability issues so we have such SDG 17 indicators where they can map up into sev map out into several ways or, or matrices, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, and indices, right? Uh, I, I wouldn't go detail on this, but the fact that I think you are aware aware of the SDG 11, which st uh, specifically states uh, sustainable cities and communities, that is a uh, goal 11, uh, and they have a sub uh, uh, index uh, lead all the way, uh, you know, to probably. Um, uh, Probably increasing by this time, you know. So we have we have other authorities, uh, stakeholders that then try to devise uh, further index. You know, so for example, like City Prosperity Initiative Index, uh, where we they come up with a CPI, CQI, and many sorts of uh, 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 in indices. You know, that 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 goes about to measure the the efficacy of sustainability initiatives that is being put uh, all throughout the world. Right. Uh, these are based on 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 the. Um, is anchored on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Yeah, so far so good. Yeah, all right. Uh, and uh, and also you have a, a matrix a matrix uh, that has been devised uh, uh, solely to actually measure and also to actually assess and evaluate. Well, they are they are they are numbers. They are they are they are they are uh, right, right policy driven, but but they are numbers that that uh, stipulates the, the the achievement of relevant targets and so on and so forth. Right. Plenty of diagrams that we have seen uh, 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 denoting uh, the the extent of how SDG, sorry, uh, sustainability and uh, sustainable development has been uh, been uh, what do you call it uh, has been embedded in, in in policies and so on and so forth. Right. Uh, just to be a bit more detailed, it's SDG 11 uh, stipulates targets uh, and the indicators. Right. The point is here. The point I'm trying to make here is not the the indicators, the indices. Just watch over the right hand side image, which is part of an urban uh, conurbation uh, that actually clearly sets out the face or the physical aspects of urban de even development. And therefore, one that we would assume would affect greatly uh, the lives of people, right? It is a clear indicator of how cities are actually evolving. Uh, and how the cities are actually sprawling, shrinking, uh, and how cities are actually um, experiencing so many uh, uh, challenges uh, to the fact that, you know, due to gentrification, for example, you might have 
the shape and form, the morphology that you have you, that you see in the image. All right. So this is the the the, the effects, the impact of of of, uh, of development that somehow does is not mentioned or could not be mentioned in any of these uh, 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 policies or, or guidelines or what have you. Right. It doesn't appear. For example, do does SDGs indicate they extend the nature or, or, or characterize the nature of sprawling? It doesn't, because uh, because sprawling is sp urban sprawl is is, is uh, the effect the impact. So in other words, what you have here uh, action taken without the the thought sometimes perhaps uh, without without the, the the awareness of the implication that you will create. So uh, let me give you further uh, further images, and each of these images tell you a more differentiated stories, and you do not have to resort to to the extent that you apply scientific uh, methods to actually understand what is happening here, because I think uh, I think by 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 large body of knowledge we have at this stage no we we can actually know and detect and feel and empathize what's happening in these cities. You know what is happening in cities, especially in urban areas. You know, uh, and and do you notice that the the, the image on on the left hand bottom side is actually the emergence of a, an unintended high rise skyscraper, whereas we are well known, especially in Malaysia, we have in we have intent we have in, uh, sorry, uh, the the emergence of unintended uh, high rise uh, in slums. You know uh, that probably parallel uh, the intended uh, development of high rise. For example, you have in, in across the world in, in in established cities. You know, uh, and uh, yeah, in Kuala Lumpur we have uh, plenty of uh, uh, what do you call it uh, world ranking high rise offices, uh, but not to the extent that we have the image that we have uh, of the slums uh, in in the left right hand side. Okay, sprawl is an impact to see and observe and consider. You don't need to find it; you see. It. All right. You don't need to find it. You'll see it. You, the moment you drive out of your town, you'll see it. In fact, you do not need to go to drive out of your town. Just move out of your house. You will see sprawl. It is evident. And to the extent that one of the researchers which I've read, uh, he's, 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 he's uh, writing the fact that you, you, you probably uh, currently the most important study is probably impact analysis. The first thing that comes to mind is probably impact, you know, uh, because it has come uh, uh, to our doorstep, the impact of what has been served 10 years, 20 years, 30 years ago, right? So, so let us not uh, 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 ponder further about this, but we, we are aware of this uh, very much. Okay, now, uh, uh, with regards to sprawl, this issue about unintended emergence uh, is related to, among others, among many, is about low density of dwellings development. And you have the auto, the automotive dependency on, on we depend on the cars, right? And then you have a, a spirally growth from urban centers and the idea also of leapfrogging, leapfrogging patterns of urban development. You have street development and you have undefined edge between urban and rural areas and many, many more. Okay. Uh, but one interesting thought by Torrance and Alberti, uh, he say, uh, they, was, they were saying that sprawl can be characterized by poor accessibility because opportunities are themselves partially separated from other opportunities. Take note, it's not so much about the physicality, it's about preventing opportunities being being uh, exercised, being being taken, taken opportunity, you know, you, you, uh, you, uh, some segment of societies are being prevented the opportunities, the potential to actually grow themselves, you know. So so I think I think this is a very crucial issue that is more in line with what we call as equity. Right, it's a social economic uh, uh, development that somehow it does not uh, transfer itself, uh, does not um, manifest itself in all these SDG, the sustainable documents. Right, so we have to take note on this. Right, uh, and and also uh, I think this is a very important fact: the fact that uh, uh, what do you call it, um, the possibility of mismatch between housing and job locations. Uh, and many other things, you know, so many traits uh, 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 that that relate to layout, the nature of the layout of cities, uh, social diversity, diversity, walkability, accessibility. I think the the the, the list goes on, right? Uh, and and also uh, other challenges that we face: air pollution, uh, pollution of all sorts, 
inadequate facilities, inefficient street layouts, inflated costs of public transportation, well, cost by public transportation. So we have transport oriented development coming up uh, as, as a justification for development, right? Uh, and we lost time due, uh, of productivity uh, due to committing, okay? Uh, uh, and low diversity of housing, health problem, and of course, we recently had the pand pandemic and still is experiencing this, uh, you know, uh, and, and less space for conservation parks, uh, high capita use of energy, uh, loss of biodiversity, so on and so on, all right? Uh, and more and more, I wouldn't go through this. Now, um, this serves a, a, a big purpose, meaning that um, uh, urban sprawl can be served as a very, very uh, telling case study, tangible case study, and they form a unit of analysis or units of analysis. Uh, that is very important. Uh, it's not so much of, of, of the word sprawl, but it's just the way morphology of the city of, of buildings uh, in a conurbation uh, uh, develop, uh, evolve, you know. So, so this is about the health, the, it's, it's about the health and the state of buildings evolution, you know, uh, with people, you know, uh, uh, that's, that that's appeared uh, ever since uh, the dawn of man uh, became civilized, you know, the, because the urbanization process has gone on for uh, more than many centuries, you know. Uh, and millennium, in fact, you know, so it is a, a real phenomenon and it is a real indicator, right? Uh, and and you just you just have to look into the dynamics of people's social movement of sites and places, okay? Uh, the world is an urban world, you know, uh, uh, and widely recognized that the battle for sustainable development is won and lost in cities, in sites. I would call sites from now on, yeah? Uh, rather than cities, they look very remote, uh, very remote, they feel very remote, but I would say that the battle for sustainability is won and lost in our sites, around us, our places. Even better, you know, the act of placemaking is won. Uh, sustainability is won and lost in the act of placemaking, you know. Uh, and and uh, the significant sense of sprawling uh, and densities to some pose a major threat, you know, to the future of sustainability in the planet, uh, right? Okay, so, uh, uh, and this sprawl, sprawl uh, issue has come up uh, time and time again. So as cities, sites, spaces, and places become critical anchor for general sustainability, it is a litmus test and barometer for effective role of sustainable development, right? Now, um, lots of talks about sustainable development. How do we operationalize this? Because I think uh, we want to do action. We want to we want to embark on actions rather than just delving, delving on documents upon documents. Uh, action is uh, is pertinent. Okay. How many sites and urban aggregation building, etc., manifest change and transformation? Uh, this is a very important issue. How do you actually uh, one of the one of the um, one of the uh, prerequisites to design uh, act of design is to understand change and transformation? I think this is a very fundamental existential issue, right? You don't you don't we don't evolve from something that is, you know, uh, abruptly in, on on, you know, we we, we evolve right uh, as 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 city states as communities and so on and so forth. So there is a need here to accommodate change, variation, differentiation, abstraction, and so on and so forth. So these are these are elements and measures of changes. Change and transformation is is practically the one that is probably uh, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? The one that doesn't change is change, right? So change and trans transformation is inevitable. So therefore, uh, if you look at, uh, 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 at studies and mostly these studies are made from the point of view or the perspective of NGOs, non-governmental organizations, rather than uh, rather than top-bottom governmental organizations, which is the theory of change or logic model approach. Uh, this is where I think I think uh, the study leads to the study of uh, the, the 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 range of study from or based on this logic model goes all the way to study impact and impact analysis, right? And also the fact that they study relationships and patterns of change is very essential. How can you make decisions without understanding relationships and patterns? How can you make decisions without the understanding of the impact that you're going to create? Now, this bothers me, I think, uh, uh, personally, and, and uh, it, is, it, is, uh, uh, it is a crime, actually, to, to propose initiatives upon initiatives without understanding the facts on the ground. You know? uh, and how do you actually, of course, this is a, also a, a clue word, a, a cue, a very important cue. How do you actually undertake appropriate intervention 
Now, intervention to me is a very significant word because uh, it represents flux of change, anticipating flux of change and the potential transformation uh, through intervention. And what will be the nature and context of design intervention that you will undertake? Okay. Uh, so, so sometimes maybe the word design might be uh, uh, too colloquial, uh, too common. You, sh you, sh you know, we should just say just say intervention by design, right? And then uh, further question is how to adapt and intervene for change and transformation. The issue of adaptation, adaptive uh, and, uh, in the intervention is also very important. Now, I draw three examples, which I'll probably show you the images, uh, the next slide, uh, of, of a, a river called Uteka Bridge, which is in Honduras, uh, the uh, Kiruna movement, uh, and the Indiana Bell Telephone building, and the Pindah Rumah concept, which is the moving house concept. Uh, uh, quite prevalent in, in Southeast Asia, in traditional communities in tra Southeast Asia. Uh, and then how do we challenge, uh, how uh, the challenges of operationalization in sustainable development, development still remains, and how do we ascertain initiatives of sustainable development that can generate tangible, workable, practical solution? At the moment, it is difficult to comprehend uh, because uh, uh, much are expected at the higher level of hierarchy. Uh, the policymakers uh, expect much. Bankers, financiers expect much, expects, uh, much uh, through ESG, the the the, uh, the economic and social and governance uh, uh, documentations uh, that societies uh, groups will submit, okay, uh, in order to actually uh, get financial aid and so on and so forth, right? These are the houses, um, unassuming activities that goes on to actually uh, quite surprisingly define. Uh, uh, the response of uh, communities uh, and certain uh, uh, organizations to change and transformation and uh, and there are not many and these are just traditional communal communities and and uh, on the top you see kiruna which is in sweden they were reacting to uh, massive contamination of their original city the whole city was transformed move sorry okay and then indiana bell telephone building was shifted 16 degrees 16 feet sorry to the south and then 90 degrees turn and 30 feet to the west this building you have you, you see in the left corner uh, right hand uh, right hand side is actually shifted in 1929 and they, it was done at ease relatively you know compared to how do you actually how could you move such a bulky massive building by this specific coordinates you know uh, at ease and it was done in a, in probably a short time in 1929 Okay, uh, it, is, it is response to some changes, you know, uh, and also, of course, of course, finally, the idea of Pindar Rumah, as you can see, a group of villagers just basically just got fed up with the location of the current house. They just moved elsewhere. <laughs> so I think um, this is something that 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 uh, that uh, that should make us ponder, you know, uh, uh, because at the moment we are we are probably uh, uh, digging up things that sometimes too overbearing for us to actually live with, you know. Okay, the idea of intervention was first mooted by uh, 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 Donella Meadows. She, she was basically saying in through her 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 characteristics, uh, four system characteristics, uh, which is she called leverage points. Is basically to ask where do we intervene, how do we intervene. I think uh, we never never sort of ask this question because because the fact that since change and transformation or change uh, uh, rather. Uh, is inevitable. You should ask next: How do you intervene, or how do you design? You know, so 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 the nature of intervention takes up many covers many aspects of many dimension. One of them is systemic system. When you change, when you design, when well, design basically is an act of intervention. Whichever way you look at it, you know, uh, you would design, for example, adaptive reuse for 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 a heritage building. It's a form of intervention, although not flashy design like Zaha did. Okay, but it is a form of intervention that tells you that makes you ask where on how do I design? How do I know that it's the right place to, to sorry, where and how do I intervene? And how do I know it's it's the right way, the right approach? So Donella Meadows, the late Donella, Professor Donella Meadows uh, got it on the spot. And and she's just asked a, an anchor question. Uh, on, on how we deal with our lives, especially we designers, uh, architects, and what have you, you know. Okay, now we come to this agency of design, right? Uh, uh, the, I would call them agency of design because uh, design 
contrary to many understanding, it's a discipline and science. I know that we have many schools of architecture uh, that that pride themselves as being being one that undertake the education in the discipline and science designs. Well, none of the school architecture does that. I would like to assert that, you know, uh, because uh, everyone, you know, uh, going back to the definition of design, everyone designs who devise courses action aim at ex changing existing situation into preferred ones. It's a futuristic act. You are changing from one point to another. Therefore, you need to know where to leverage, how to intervene, which point. All right. Uh, this is a skill. This is a discipline. This is a science. Changing situations into preferred ones, you know. So, in other words, intellectual activity that produces material artifacts is no different fundamentally from the one that prescribes remedies for a sick patient. In other words, there is nothing to differentiate a designer of buildings, architects, from a doctor who treats a patient. I know for one that uh, medical doctors, they, they, they resort to diagnostic approach. Try one attempt. If it doesn't work, try the next one and the next one. So diagnostic plays a very important part in the doctor and it's part and parcel of a design act. You know, so, 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 and, and these are all been mentioned, uh, has been mentioned uh, quite for some time, you know, imagine Herbert Simon is one of these father, founding fathers of, you know, a leading, uh, leading, uh, 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 well, he, he won a Nobel, 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 uh, Nobel Prize, by the way, not in design, but something else, you know. So in his book, Sciences of Artificial. Okay, uh, with regards to engineering, medicine, business, architecture, and painting, they are all concerned not with the necessary, but with the contingent. So the keyword is contingent, meaning that uh, um, uh, you are not concerned with how things are, but how they might be, what ought to be. You know, words like ought or might are the favorite words of designers. If we as designers and architects are not aware of this, then we are actually not within the discipline and science of design. So, so if we want to, to ask, you know, us what is a design? It's designs ought to how they might be. It's a futuristic. It's a contingent. It's a, it's 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 got uh, it's got reasons, you know, uh, and also of course, um, uh, uh, otherwise, you know, if you say how things ought to be, you know, therefore you you should have goals to attain and function to perform. So in other words, design is a performative goal seeking, you know, uh, and so on and so forth. And in the process of doing that, there are so many trade offs because we are we are like swimming in, in, in the sea of, of so many challenges and we've got to trade off these challenges and or variables, I would call it, you know. Another thing is that um, uh, what you call it, uh, the central task of natural science is to make wonderful commonplace and to show that complexity. Now, this is uh, our forte, actually. Designers are supposed to be to be to be adept, to be skillful in dealing with with uh, challenges that relates to complexity. What is complexity? It has even got its own definition, but I wouldn't want to say here. But but it's a, it's it's part of the discipline, you know. Uh, and uh, correctly viewed, is only a mass of simplicity, meaning that a designer uh, overcomes complexity with simplicity. If if uh, designers and architects have not come to this competency. You're not yet a designer, you know, uh, and, and, and the fact that you do that in order to find pattern hidden in apparent chaos. So, so it's like, it's like a probe. What you do is like probing probes, you know, uh, uh, testing, constantly probing, testing, seeking, checking, mapping, you know, uh, and also finally the solving problem simply means representing it so as to make solution transparent, meaning that communication in design is part and parcel, parcel of this, this activity. Uh, is to make solution transparent, uh, and and uh, uh, I, for one, for example, keep look looking for any scientists or researchers or engineers who can actually sum up things very nicely. And Einstein is one of those that can actually sum up quite quickly, very concisely, in a short time of what is the issue is. You know. Okay. All right. Uh, again, you know, uh, buzzword design is a buzzword for integrating sustainability. Integration is required. When, when you deal with sustainable development, you cannot work on a checklist. A designer doesn't work on a checklist. Designer actually integrate the checklist and, uh, and produce a brief, you know? So briefing is part of the design's process. Uh, and, um, and the adoption of design methods by different disciplines may be weakened without detailed knowledge of its attributes and potential. I take note, uh, uh, you know, that, that a detailed knowledge of design attributes and potential is necessary. Otherwise, we'll be working and walking in the dark, you know, uh, and 
uh, further uh, design is further attributed to the resting complex and open-ended problems, as you mentioned before. And this is when uh, cities are seen as complex systems uh, for us to intervene. Remember Jane Jacobs? I think we all know Jane Jacobs. Uh, only until now I realized that actually Jane Jacobs, despite the fact that she was a commoner, she wasn't an architect, she wasn't a planner, or she wasn't a, a lawyer like such, you know. Uh, but she, all throughout the discussion, she was actually talking about cities as problems of organized complexity, which to her meant dealing simultaneously with sizable number of factors which are interrelated into organic whole. Organic whole. I was quite surprised because this came out from Jane Jacobs, you know. After all that we've read so far, she actually perhaps has, has got more in understanding than many of us, most of us, you know, and, and who knows about complexity is a hallmark of structure with variations, where structure results from interactions among a system's component. Again, systems are mentioned, you know, uh, interactions are mentioned. Uh, and further on design, it's about novelty and innovation. Yeah, that's practically what we all know so far. Design would actually become a base for novelty, innovation, creativity. Yes, that's common. But try and let us try to actually dissect that. It will have trouble doing that. You know, what do you mean by novelty? What do you mean by innovation? Okay. And also design has got properties dealing with emergence, which is not summation of parts. Emergence are something that appears ongoing that will, will inspire you. Okay. Uh, and also, of course, again, the reinforcement and systemic characteristics of cities. I go, I move on. Uh, three of my, uh, well, Three of my favorite quotations that is deeper than what it seems uh, is this one, which 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 is by Professor the late Professor Ulrich Neiser, uh, Professor in Cognition, that we cannot perceive unless we anticipate, but we must not only see what we anticipate, all right. And then the next one, we being able to go beyond information, given the figures, given to figures things to figure things out, is one of the few untarnishable joys of life. You know, being able to scour the information and then to figure out things, you know, and he is pro he's also a tribute to the idea that you go beyond the information. Uh, basically, you cannot live by by what is sufficient alone. You have to go beyond the borders, as they say it. Yeah. Okay. Now, sight. This thing about sight, uh, and, and if we can recall uh, again, apart from Jane Jacobs, Lynch, 1960, has been mentioned before, but never in the way that 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 uh, clearly express uh, nowadays, I, I, I do find joy in actually reading and rereading. Uh, so, and the, the things like district edge landmarks and notes by Lynch, they represent a form of referential value, which is, steep, which is meant for cognition and navigation. You know, navigation, cognition, mediation, we require referential value. And this is where district edge landmarks and notes form the city. As you can see now, we're appearing more and more into a spatial realm, uh, a place realm, rather than rather than a set of documentations that are found in hundreds of pages in a in a document or many documents, right? And then you have uh, the vis the physical information of the environment. Now this is very important. This is what we do. Uh, we require physical information in order to map and analyze, right? And slowly again, we start to build up. Uh, 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 the image of the cities, uh, and as you can see, different cities in the world represent different DNA or different typology or topology of things. And even if you if you begin to, I, I think I think uh, some uh, uh, a colleague just now mentioned about automation algorithm. Yes, algorithm might be might be helpful uh, in order to determine uh, the, the the state of or the, the condition, the morphology of the city. Uh, for example, maybe the idea of a smart city uh, might be might be uh, the tool might be using algorithms to actually detect and map out and analyze. Right. Furthermore, you have uh, what Shannon. Uh, uh, this is related to design. What they call entropy, right? Uh, which is to determine order and predictability. All you need to do is actually to plan and order, and to map out that order. Uh, or the plan into your real world, then you'll see the state of that order or disorderness. And if from then on, you are able to predict and predictably, predictability is a very important factor in design. How can you not predict uh, when you're designing, you know? Uh, and, 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 and it is the prediction or predictability forms the basis of what, we, what I call as the design hypothesis. So far, we are familiar with research hypothesis, but design hypothesis 
is the uh, essential uh, thing, you know, because it stipulates boundaries that you need to deal with and it's got predictive powers and interpretation. Okay, from entropy, from from mapping, the, uh, from, from manners of mapping the sites, you have a network uh, being detected and shaped uh, as you see it. As you as you undertake cognition of the city or the sites or place or space, whatever you call it, you know it's grounded in this grounded place. You know, so 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 network based on entropy or knowledge or information and so on and so forth. There's so much. There's so many things that we need to know and to actually allow us to actually understand our world much better in relation to sustainability. So it is about the real account encounter. Uh, that that is that is uh, essential in built environment is real it's not it's not something that is uh, that is virtual you know uh, and and um, uh, and you need to actually uh, make some basic assumptions for material representation and reproduction of built environment uh, and you need a means to support and express uh, interaction and association you know and so on and so forth and uh, uh, so social space can therefore relate inherently to the practices of association uh, and when we mean association, it's about it's about real encounter, not virtual encounters, which could hardly hold a society together. This is something. This is a statement which which I found quite striking, because we are now in the world a metaverse of virtuality, but they cannot hold the society together. It has to be a real world, uh, and so on and so forth. And with that information, with all this information, you know about space. Therefore, we can take advantage of the potential of interact interactivity and the encounters could be in the form of uh, uh, networks, right? Uh, and men mention about the word emergent uh, and it's, it's, it's funny now, it's, it's about boundaries, it's about relationship. Uh, and if you notice, the, just the first, uh, just take note on the first boundary, uh, 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 first uh, uh, set of drawings, uh, first on to your left, you'll see changes in topology, what we call a topology relationship. Uh, this is a between a lake and a log. A log is a floating on a lake, right? But once the the the, the lake is outside, uh, the log is outside, the lake is considered as outside. But then once the log gets into the, the, the lake, it becomes part and parcel of that side of the lake. Okay? And this is what happens when you tell a story of uh, the Koluteka bridge phenomenon. I think this is very important for engineers in particular, uh, uh, infrastructural uh, engineers, designers. Okay, uh, for those who does not are not familiar with Koliteka Bridge, it's a bridge that was built top notch, well designed, well built, but in the space of what uh, in a few years it became useless. The fact that the, the the river actually changed, and the bridge became redundant. Uh, and topologically, I'm using the expression topologically, the bridge is out of, out of place. And it could not perform its original function, and this should serve as a as a notice to all designers, the fact that the very first precepts or concepts that you derive to design whatever you are you are in you are you are you are required to design must be clear, must be embedded, grounded, and and uh, they are they are really serve to form to perform the specific function and role that you play. So in other words. Uh, otherwise, you'd have this phenomenon, what we call as a Kolitika bridge phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. So, so we have this mapping, this, this, uh, these ideas, these notes, and all this, uh, this, uh, this morphological uh, uh, elements that denote change and transformation. Now we are able to actually formulate design constructs. Constructs are bases or scaffolds that you allow ideas to come in. You know, uh, this is how I, I, I term it. You know, uh, you need to construct. A scaffold for design for all the ideas to settle down you know and to to trade off between themselves right so you need this uh, so in other words a site when they are properly considered uh, uh, especially in in the context of a uh, network uh, spatial uh, differentiation abstraction and all that uh, they, they are good base for design construct and then finally you know um uh this is this is probably you know a, a summary of 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 uh, of what is is perhaps uh, can be summed up from, from, from the discussion so far. Uh, and I would say that this is uh, only an early concept and all, uh, an, an early idea uh, of what has been observed uh, throughout the, the, the studies and research and observation. Uh, and and uh, you have, a, you, you have a whereby 
design might be considered as a as a gambit for sustainable development for those who don't, do not do not familiar with the word gambit is an instrument uh, to actually guide your your process uh, and and uh, you have movement two ways you have two two uh, two parallel movements but they go uh, different uh, they, they go either sides either ways right one is the fact that we as designers with our understanding and knowledge of design attributes uh, we will actually uh, confront and, uh, and and face the parameters, the challenges, the issues that come from that stems from 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 issues that we regard as related to sustainability. So, so the arrows, as, as you can see, the diagram of the design nexus, the world of encounters, interaction, uh, uh, and differentiation, and utility and performance. You you need to trigger it. That's why uh, a design uh, would actually involve probing. Design will actually involve modeling because you need to trigger. You need to trigger the, the anticipation. You, you need to anticipate. Therefore, you need to construct an anticipation framework. So as it goes forward, so does it meets up with all the issues, the problems, the variables, the indices, the metrics uh, that comes along. Uh, and, and it is the clash of this where, where, where we call design access or the world of encounters that would allow us to anticipate and perceive. Uh, uh, and then and not to only see what we anticipate and also to go, to go beyond information and and it's it's like a, it's like a a, a pathfinder uh, and for for another word design i would call it uh, one that seeks uh, the clear path ahead of everyone else so when you see design as a goal oriented process it follows the argument that design goals are generally incomplete that's true we deal with an incomplete world because we need to rush uh, we need to come uh, with the first mvp the the first uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the 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 viable uh, product, the the most viable, the the earliest viable product. So the world, the the briefs are incomplete, the goals are incomplete. So therefore, we have to orientate ourselves. Uh, and as we orientate ourselves, uh, then we are able to actually encounter emergence of new concepts, requirements, and specification. You know, uh, uh, that emerge from interaction. The 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 place in the middle of this diagram, which is the design axis, right? So an emergent design concept that appears. It mobilizes and trigger further design actions. So I think um, just as uh, sums up nicely uh, at this early stage uh, of how how we actually uh, uh, could actually uh, uh, advocate an attitude towards design, uh, and and uh, of course there are many more uh, uh, detailed outlines of this. Uh, I would say that uh, if uh, uh, if given the second chance, would. Go for for the next uh, talk on 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 the attributes and and also the 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 way that the the design encounters all these challenges. All right, with that, uh, I think um, thank you very much. Uh, and over to you, uh, Doctor PC. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Associate Professor Doctor Cairo. Okay, for your comprehensive and interesting topics. Okay, so yeah, uh, we have some questions over here later on. Uh, I think we will. Uh, mention it in the uh, final sessions. Okay, so all right. So now we go into our last speakers of second session today. Associate Professor Dr. Kichai Jika John Wanis from Walaila University, Thailand. Okay, let me introduce uh, Associate Professor Dr. Kichai first. Okay, he received his PhD in University of Sheffield, England, UK. He is the immediate past dean of Schools of Architecture and Design, Walaila University. He is actively involved in various research and publications and also the recipients of multiple awards in research and competitions. His areas of expertise includes architectural design, thermal comfort, building science, vernacular architecture, community participations and artificial intelligence. All right, without further ado, let us welcome Associate Professor Dr. Kitchai to present his topic entitled Authentic Participation versus Pseudo Participations. Prof, the room is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. PC. Uh, I would like to share my slide. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, this is uh, the this topic uh, of uh, uh, participation uh, is come from my uh, new uh, literature review. That's uh, I try to explore into a new area of uh, research. Uh, formerly, 
uh, I have been research on thermal comfort and especially uh, in the uh, transitional space. Uh, but now so I have um, an opportunity to explore another top, uh, another subject. Uh, and now we try to do uh, the um, uh, literature review and this is a part of uh, my uh, incoming uh, ongoing uh, paper that's uh, to be published very soon. Uh, I call it uh, authentic participation and pseudo participation because of um, one of the reasons that uh, we have found before that uh, we we know that uh, many research um, in the field we uh, involve the particip participation uh, method, but um, how can we uh, ascertain that um, our methodology is uh, quite correct to the uh, to the research uh, outcome, and uh, can we uh, can we uh, expect it uh, to have a result uh, to be applied in the real situation that's uh, to be useful for our uh, subject that's uh, we go into uh, the field. That's uh, one of the topic uh, that I would like to explore. Uh, the first uh, the first slide is uh, come from uh, Einstein, which is uh, uh, quite uh, famous for quite famous uh, for the uh, participation design. Uh, this is a poster uh, in in uh, in his in her paper. Uh, it's calling that uh, a French student poster. Uh, which uh, in English translated into I participate, you participate, he participates, we participate, you participate, then they profit. That uh, we can see that uh, so many people have to get involved into a project design, uh, and and uh, and after all, uh, everybody can get profit. So first of all, I would like to uh, explain what is uh, the PD or uh, participatory design. This is uh, an approach of design which involves many stakeholders. When we call stakeholders, it means uh, so many people. And in the past, uh, we mean just only uh, involving people. But in the uh, contemporary or maybe in the future, we can see the stakeholder uh, have involved in a, a larger area of uh, people. Uh, we involve uh, many stakeholders in the process and especially, and another thing on the um, definition is the object of design, whose object of design, which is belong to the needs of several customer and all the partners. We call all this a uh, customer, that's uh, all the partner that uh, into our research is community. The other name of uh, participatory design is is uh, is called uh, cooperative design, which uh, have uh, been occur uh, as a uh, earliest uh, stage of uh, participatory design in Scandinavian. Another uh, name is called co-design, and another one is uh, co-creative. But um, the um, the meaning of a uh, co-design or co-creative or cooperative design is um, maybe just only just only two partners. So uh, we understand uh, participatory design is uh, in including uh, more partners uh, in the research. The focus uh, is not just only um, actually uh, the participatory design or PD uh, is not. Um, it's not focused on the design style or 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 the result that uh, you get the people just only get involved and you call it a part, 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 participation. But actually, uh, the focus should be on the process and and uh, procedures of the research or the practice, uh, which uh, is starting with the initial explore, exploration and to find uh, the definition of the problem. Um, this is, um, this is uh, maybe uh, uh, more or less as the same as the design uh, program at, 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 at the beginning. But uh, you will find uh, later 
uh, not just only uh, to uh, to the problem definition, but sometimes you such you just only issue definition that uh, will be okay because uh, some community has no problem. And the second stage uh, is the is the de development stage. That's uh, to propose ideas and solutions. This is a very long period of time in of 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 the research and and so many times it's uh, going to the iterative uh, system that uh, we have to uh, go, uh, uh, go, uh, go forward and backward, go forward and backwards uh, all the time that's uh, to make sure that uh, the development state has to be in the in the track. That is not the idea of uh, finding, finding uh, solutions. And very importantly, that's uh, the implementation that's uh, we have to include the end user as a central role because we have to ensure that the result has to be uh, work uh, usable and will be very useful. Therefore, uh, the PD is an approach to place making. This, uh, this is the word that uh, I really like it and um, that's uh, to give the meaningful, uh, not just only the space, but it's a place that's uh, meaning uh, to the user of the of, of, of the of the area so we go into a little bit of a history of the pd as we uh, have seen in many uh, literature if you go into the pd uh, research uh, uh, it will uh, start with the scandinavian uh, project uh, on the participation in the system development and the very first one is uh, in the workplace of uh, computer applications uh, workplace. Um, from that starting point, uh, is uh, it going to the architecture and also to uh, many uh, fields uh, on the research. That's uh, quite amazing. And now it's still in the computer uh, applications uh, uh, program. Uh, the first one is the um, they do cooperative uh, design because uh, they would like to help improve the quality of working life. And maybe it's um, the, to improve the quality of working life is, um, is can apply to, to many areas uh, of the study, especially for the healthcare that uh, I have involved with the, the nurse school, school of nurse and also uh, the school of, of architecture that uh, we can work uh, together. In another one that uh, has been mentioned in Australia, there's, um, there's growing demand of community opinion to the major decision making, that's, uh, especially for the changes of uh, built environment, that the people feel that when the government uh, doing some uh, of the planning in the built environment, they just only plan, plan, plan at, not just plan, plan for. So, this is a plan for is a um, it has a meaning that's a try to get involved people into the process of design, and the people uh, really would like to be in a part of uh, decision making. Also in Britain, that's uh, in 1965, the idea of participation as an important issue, as as we can see uh, until now today, that's a uh, many. Um, uh, many uh, researchers uh, come from the Britain, Britain and uh, is uh, have a, a quite uh, a significant uh, uh, publications uh, from from uh, from that country because of the public public works uh, and uh, in school to the public workshop and hearings uh, became uh, become has become a, a pan, a, a every pending endeavor. We will go through the successful concept of uh, the PD that uh, maybe we can see it in the future is uh, in, it will be in the categories of the authentic uh, participation that um, the involving user have to understand their roles in the design process. It is, um, it is to be admit that uh, the participation can be 
uh, many uh, form of uh, research. Sometimes it's just only the implicit. Sometimes the user uh, just only uh, share their points of view, and sometimes uh, uh, the, uh, the the user of the of the research is into the mutual learning as the um, uh, des designer as a uh, expert of the subject. But uh, we cannot ignore uh, the the user, which uh, they are the people of the area of the fields. And they know a lot of uh, new situation and also the implication when uh, they they have to uh, do the implement stage. So uh, the successful that's uh, the goals have to be explicit discussed, and the met method or methodology has to uh, address the key issues. The key issue is mean um, every process of the of the system uh, has to be known and uh, to be uh, have uh, explicit as a goal of uh, every step as uh, we have mentioned before sometimes the uh, participation uh, research is an uh, iterative system and the mutual learning is uh, um, have to uh, cooperate bet between uh, designers and the user and of course the user has to be informed that uh, they can perform uh, potential suggestions not just only uh, let the um, uh, experts of um, of the designer or architect uh, to do all the design, and most uh, significantly is the, the user have to be uh, the decision making. The fund fundamental of the uh, PD aspect, uh, we can. Um, in a literature review of uh, Haskop and Hansen, uh, saying that uh, there are uh, five uh, aspects that's uh, the politics. Uh, we admitted that um, uh, PD project has to uh, concern with the politic aspect because uh, the people who are affected by a decision should have an opportunity to influence it. That's uh, we we would like to call all the people into our uh, research. And the people itself play, play uh, critical roles in the design by being expert in their own life. Of course, this uh, will be the expert of the subject. That's uh, if we are doing uh, the built environment, the architect maybe will be uh, the helper or the designer of the program. The context or the use situation is the fundamental starting point for uh, all of the design processes because um, we have to understand as a uh, where are we going to uh, do a participation work and also the method method and the mean for user to gain influence in the design process this is a uh, very in, in important things one that's um uh, you have to it it is it is very important that's uh, to not get lost into the uh, the iteration process that's uh, to understand uh, which state or which um, uh, try to use uh, which one the the goals of uh, methodology and of course the product of the um, participation is the to improve uh, quality of life okay uh, now we will go into uh, some of the development in the architectural practice uh, we would like, uh, I really would like uh, to show this uh, quotation by the Di Carlo in the 1970s. Um, in reality, architecture has become too important to be left to architects alone. So that buildings and using become two different parts of the same planning process. So we can see that uh, at the end, the building and the using, um, maybe it can be in the same way or maybe it's not. That's why uh, it's happened. That's um, because of the process of the design that uh, can tell of it. We going back to the Einstein that uh, she showed the um, level of uh, participation can be defined in uh, different degrees. If the first degree is uh, non-participation, then then uh, the manipulation will be a tokenism as a way of consultation. Uh, I would like to mention that that uh, these two degrees of uh, levels uh, are not the uh, real participation, or maybe we can uh, we can call it pseudo participation in later. 
and uh, the full participation of uh, this of the citizen control can be called a genuine one or, or authentic. This is uh, uh, her uh, presentation of the ladder of uh, citizen participation. That's um, we can see that um, if the project has not been in uh, participation at all, so it it can be called just only manipulation or maybe just only the therapy. That's uh, to solve uh, the the to heal to heal the the user in the area and not doing any more. And this non participation uh, will cannot uh, improve the quality of life uh, for the long term. The second uh, decay is called uh, tokenism. That's uh, maybe you can inform the audience or maybe inform the user. You can give a consultation or maybe you can make a presentation. But it's also the same as uh, the, the, the pseudo participation uh, cannot give a, a very successful uh, project. But um, if you give the citizen power either uh, by um, to give them a partnership or delegate power and also the citizen control, that's um, the project can be a uh, work very, very successful. Uh, by uh, the Caro himself, he is uh, maybe he can be a social architect. That's uh, he mentioned socially engaged practice uh, should be created with uh, equitable, inclusive process and welcoming diversity. That uh, you can see that's an individual user as an autonomous participant with it is a um, is very important one. Uh, I have a uh, search in the. Um, I have searched in uh, his um, his uh, his uh, his prolific work, and we found that uh, this uh, one of uh, his sketch, which is a stu structure of trees inhabited by people, which is a very uh, beautiful one, and maybe uh, can can see that's uh, how community architect as him as uh, humanity as well. Uh, another development that is called seal, uh, cell built uh, that um, come from many uh, British uh, or European um, uh, projects that uh, they use uh, their own experience and local know-how that's uh, to uh, to create their own community, and this is uh, have another uh, benefit that uh, they can control over financial and management. Uh, the idea of a cell build is come from the freedom to build by uh, John um, uh, Turner and uh, Robert Fitchers. This is a book called uh, Freedom to Build that's uh, uh, collect, collecting the stuff of the cell build. Another one uh, that uh, many architects in the 70s uh, have been known that's uh, come from the Lucian Coal. And this is the, the cell build of the medical student housing, which is kind of the famous project. And the uh, last one that uh, I have uh, to do in this uh, review uh, of uh, come from the Nebul Hamdi, uh, the, first, the professor that uh, have uh, many books about um, um, people participation project. This one is come from a book called Small Chain. That's uh, uh, the decision making uh, in uh, formality one in the urban life of a small scale can create the impact over the large scale project uh, because this is uh, the uh, his uh, proposition is for uh, participate participation uh, planning uh, toward the triggering up effect of cell organized system here here is uh, his uh, book cover and also the exhibition has, uh, has been um, uh, to show as well so okay, I would like to uh, come with um, the um, uh, the summary of the authentic participation and pseudo participation as um, participate participatory is taken as a trend. Yes, of course. Uh, now we can see uh, many research and many projects that uh, we call is PD PD, and uh, we get involved people into uh, our uh, project and. Uh, we, we call it a PD already, but anyway, if it leads uh, to tokenistic practice uh, and also being understood and 
and and critically uh, the real engagement of the user is not involved but it just only a uh, fail uh, for consensus or priority of uh, designers on agenda or we uh, too much on the designers uh, uh, designs that's a uh, will be um, uh, pseudo one here the here the final slide that uh, I would like to um, conclude uh, from the DAOs and also in my interpretations of the implication of uh, this question was when we see uh, why is the authentic or pseudo participation if the authentic one is uh, we have to do intention we have the intention to improve the design improve the quality of life but if uh, participation just only uh, to show the public app, app, app acceptance of a potential scheme that may be uh, into the political political aspect of the of the false participation who can be uh, joined into the authentic uh, participation is a self directed social conscious architect of course this is the architect side and it's also have the involving people in the community side as well but the um, pseudo participation architect just only involved in predetermine uh, the final outcomes and he always uh, like to decide and to propose of um, of the his uh, screen right and whom whom is the authentic authentic participation is the local expert to reach its limits uh, actually, uh, they as and they in the, in their community, they know uh, how much uh, they would like to gain and what is the real problem of the or the real issue of uh, of their community. But um, but the pseudo one is uh, you always collect the professional experts to take over. Uh, the majority of how can be the authentic one is the you have to be an open-ended community let that and let them have a decision making instead of a passive consultation approach which um, uh, um, it's not just only the the real uh, the real problem or the real issue of the community uh, another question was that uh, i use is the method uh, of which uh, benefiting the result and also we compare with the method focusing on making engagement inclusive transparency. And finally, if we as an architect, uh, that's, uh, we try to, um, to do an authentic uh, 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 design process, we have to be with the participation design or we can call it a design with community not just only the duty to consult or decide for community that uh, you can do by your own. Uh, this is uh, just only um, a very brief uh, literature review of my research, but bef before I will go through uh, my um, final uh, research in um, uh, community with the local enterprise, uh, with the community enterprise of the mud spa in the southern of uh, Nakhon Si Tamarat, uh, which uh, they have a mass bar and they go into the um, uh, to in, go, they go into uh, the sea and uh, to find uh, their local food for um, uh, to entertain the um, uh, the the guests that uh, come to visit uh, their community. That's maybe I will show is uh, in the later um, uh, discussion. Thank you very much uh, for joining me the this thank you thank you very much once again uh as i said professor dr kai okay i think this is very interesting and very critical for us to look into these uh scenarios on both the authentics as well as the studios uh, participations okay uh yeah all right so i would like to thank both speakers from session two so now i would like to open up the sessions uh q and sessions so should we have any questions you can open your mind and feel free to ask the questions or you can ask or type your questions in the chat box so make sure you quote which speaker you want your question to reach okay we have two questions over here 
for time being. One is to Dr. Cairo. Okay, for Dr. Cairo, in the Southeast Asia context, to your opinion, how can we as a designer contribute to intervene in the design of architectural built environment? For example, to what extent is the use of technology and innovation in architecture as drastic applications of technology will disrupt the flows of nature? Oh, Dr. Cairo. All right, thank you, Dr. Mishi. Wow, it's a okay. big question. <laughs> It's, it's an open-ended question, sort of. Uh, it's regarding, it's relating to technology, right? Yes. Uh, when you say technology, do you do you do you say that technology that we uh, at our disposal in in relation to design process or or uh, technology that is a, a byproduct, a product uh, uh, of 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 uh, uh, you know our design effort? So it could be a building that 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 is uh, one that actually advocate uh, technology so in other words uh, i would say that maybe there, there, there are so many dimensions to to the impact and implication i think uh, and um, and as you can see even even when talking about sustainability there's so many dimensions as well that probably three is the most you know and uh, technology to 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 deal with uh, uh, social socialization uh, social uh, development uh, in order to uh, come about with uh, design uh, you know uh, products uh, and and also also the other perspective is when you deal you use uh, you apply technology when you uh, engage and negotiate with people so for example uh, beam beam uh, we used to we probably most of us would say that beam is actually to to, to is dealing with the production of buildings but there is also a, a, a aspects of beam that actually relate to that is usually uh, now increasingly becoming more and more collaborative in nature and also, there is also beam that also uh, uh, deals with uh, uh, generational process, generating process, uh, which, which 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 then would be uh, relate to algorithm. So, in other words, there are as advanced uh, elements of 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 beam as in Revit, for example. I think I've noticed Revit uh, has got uh, the the aspects on AI. That means that means uh, you would actually, for example, if you have a set uh, uh, physical dimension of buildings, uh, sorry, sorry sites. Whereby uh, you you need to actually uh, uh, devise mixed development. How would you actually fit them into into a kind of a, a of a, of a site that also is part of a neighborhood and is also part of a city? You know this this algorithm. Uh, uh, you know what we call it as a cellular automata would actually assist uh, designers to actually. Uh, this uh, this technology has been here for for a, for the last thirty years. I think forty years. Uh, in fact, so so in other words, uh, in terms of technology, I, I I would say that we are not short of it at all. It's just what we we what the results of this technology will be, you know. So so in all aspects, in all dimension that we work with as designers, I think it it, it permeates all over. It's it's so ubiquitous. Uh, it keeps advancing. No problem. I think we have no problem with whatsoever to deal uh, in use this this technology. Uh, but but of course. Uh, the, the the one that probably is still in our minds uh, when it comes to the destruction of the environment is the ones relating to environmental. Uh, uh, so 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 I think I think uh, research and studies that uses technology, the uh, design that uses technology that 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 actually uh, mediates ecologically between us and the environment would be of importance. Uh, so so I think I think without naming any particular technology, I think I think they are, they permit all 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 sides, you know. So, so I, th I think it depends on the question whether is there any specific impl impact that we'll be looking into, you know. So, so I think that sort of a general, <laughs> maybe a conclusion that I would, I would, I would uh, 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 arrive to, you know, uh, Doctor PC. Yeah. Yeah, uh, agree. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor uh, Cairo, about that. I think yeah, this is quite open-ended questions, right? I think everyone have different views yeah. that we how we're going to respond towards that. But anyway, anyhow, this is up to us on how we derive it. Okay, another question is to Prof. Uh, Kichai. Okay, Prof. Uh, pseudo participation is an approach in architecture research, but what are the negative aspects of using this method today? Uh, I would like to mention that um, because uh, we can see the participation is uh, can be uh, applied into uh, many um, projects or many. Uh, research but um, uh, I would like to mention uh, one of the aspects that uh, we would like to uh, concern that's uh, the time the timings because um, uh, as 
uh, it's it's actually it's uh, very difficult as uh, to limit the times uh, for the community that's uh, to be uh, finished or maybe uh, to uh, get the uh, to get um, uh, to get the project done uh, with the community. But uh, in in our research, maybe we have a deadline for the submission that uh, we have to uh, to do it. And also maybe sometime if we would like to take care uh, this uh, participation into our our um, our program of design, and it will be uh, we have to be rushed in uh, to to get the result. That um, uh, that will be just only uh, the um, uh, the benefits of the part of uh, the designer part, but uh, for the user part, maybe uh, uh, they will get uh, acclimatized to the to to many people get into the community and it's uh, it will not um, uh, reliable on the research uh, anymore in the future. So I found that uh, the, uh, in in doing uh, pseudo uh, uh, participation, maybe it's quite uh, uh, dangerous and it's give uh, in the long term that um, uh, we cannot uh, develop the the projects uh, successfully. Uh, the thing is. Um, uh, it's, it is possible that uh, we have to uh, separate into um, into the stages of the development. That's uh, what 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 is the goals of uh, each stage. That's uh, you just only uh, to achieve that goal. Don't get it too high, because uh, it maybe is um, it will uh, uh, it it will be uh, not in the outcome that uh, you would like to uh, receive, right? Maybe this is um, just only uh, the opinion that's uh, how can we do uh, participation into uh, step by steps and uh, to separate into uh, many stages uh, of, uh, of the design process. All right. Thank you, Dr. Kichai, on your mm -hmm. response towards the questions. Yeah, there's always pro and cons on the two uh, kinds of the different approach on that. Uh, for sure, if possible, we're trying to go for the one that which is closer to the opinions of the people itself. Yes, okay. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Is there any other questions from the uh, floors? Okay. All right. If you shall have any questions, probably you have, can email us, okay, at the end of the webinar. All right. I think, I think our time is up today. So, yeah, let me allow me to summarize the contents of the speakers uh, for today's. Um, yeah, for speakers one, we can learn about the efficiency of the acoustic designs of the auditoriums. It should have come from the understandings of the useful basic principles, the acoustic defects, as well as the performance of the auditoriums through the simulations. So it could be designed effectively and giving a better impact if we can do it uh, from by looking from the different uh, parameters. From speaker two, the studies on the impact and the strong relationship between the physical aspect and the users compared to the social aspect. So we can see that the design and the characteristic of the underground transit public area actually has the high potential to cause the dangers to the user. So from here, through the studies, we can learn about and giving more kinds of the uh, uh, inceptions and perceptions as well as the design of uh, kinds of the uh, proposal in the future to make sure the safety of the people, especially from the women. For the speaker tree, the differences in between the conventional and computational architecture uh, from generations basically choose uh, the series of the testing and scripts from the computational process is basically well can strike the equilibrium uh, from the form makings as well as the form finding process that give a new kinds of the design paradigm of the architecture form that responded better form of sustainable design. For the speaker number four, we can learn about the uh, design imperative on the sustainable urban developments. So from here, we can see that basically a designer, actually we should have these uh, process the uh, can overcome the complexities and the simplicities, such as like the uh, scientists, okay, in order to give a more balanced kinds of the uh, design uh, for the for our future environment. For speaker number five, the ideas of participations in the design process actually has been developed throughout years 
uh, as one of the successful model prior to the implementation stage by the multiple practitioners and the designers. So from in this case, we can see that there's a pro and cons in each of that. If possible, in the future, the real engagements of the users instead of the false consensus of the designer uh, by using the own agenda, we were trying to, uh, yeah, could trying to uh, be involved or trying to max into the uh, consensus that will be in the better forms. So, all right, I think I would like to ask all the attendees to open up the cameras, okay, because we're going to have another session of the uh, photo sessions, okay, to commemorate our webinar series number two. So, please don't be shy. So, can you please switch on your camera that we can uh, take the snapshots? Yeah, are you ready? Okay, one small one, two, three. All right, I another page. One, two, and three. All right. Yeah, still have a lot of uh, friends probably still haven't switched on their camera, but I think it's fine. Okay. All right. So, okay. Thank you very much uh, for attending the webinar series one. And now we have come to the end of the sessions. Thank you again to uh, our speakers, Prof. Dr. Pradipa, uh, Madam Nevin Rafa, Prof. Mohafiz, Associate Professor Dr. Kairu Anwar, Associate Professor Dr. Kit Chai, Thank you also to our audience. It was a pleasure to have you all with us uh, with this concludes the webinar series number one. We are from UTM, hoping that our collaboration doesn't end here and hope you have a good day and goodbye for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, all. Thank you, very Thank much. you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have much. a nice day. Thank Bye. you. Thank you very much. Thank you very Bye. much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, all speakers. Thank you very much. Bye.